Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Newton. Here. Councilmember Hoffman. Here. Councilmember Grunmeyer. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bash. Yes, ma Mayor Hannah. Here. All present. Thank you. Okay, now we will. Uh, City Council will recess to close oh, session. Sorry. Oh, I forgot this isn't on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Item. How long is that going to take? Uh, we're going to talk ten, like an auctioneer. Yeah, cause ten, we're gonna, ten minutes time. Okay, we're going to talk like an auctioneer. What do we need to do? Uh, I need mm -hmm. a move to approve that. Exactly. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Grenmeyer? Mayor Pro Tem Bash. Mayor Hanna. Yes. Councilmember Newton. Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, we will re recess to close session. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call this. Uh, uh, resume this. Uh, reconvene the public session of the Norco City Council meeting and I'll let the city attorney give his report from the closed session. Yeah, the city uh, council considered in closed session that matter listed on the agenda, the performance evaluation city manager, as well as a litigation matter which was added as an urgency item, Stern versus Norco. And there are no reportable actions. Thank you. Now if you'll stand, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance by Council Member Hoffman and the followed by the invocation with Pastor Michelle Ehrenberg, the Word of Faith Fellowship. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. the name. Thank you, City. You got that taken care of for us. We got our permits, the signs going up, and we have our relaunch party on February 2nd. So you can find us by the DMV. Come join us for that. Was that a commercial in the invocation? Sorry. Um, a new year. Happy New Year. A new Year always brings new beginnings and new opportunities. And in Isaiah 43, it says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And so I want to remind you that no matter what you face, God has a way through it. And, and whatever um, interesting opportunities come your way, the Lord will see you through them. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, gracious Lord, thank you for the the very fact that you make all things new. Your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the opportunity to pray together here, to seek your presence, your guidance, and your blessings. Lord, I thank you for this council that you have called for this year. Thank you for Mayor Hannah, for Mayor Pro Tem Bash, for council members Grenmeyer, Hoffman, and Newton. Lord, I thank you for their wisdom, for their experience, their commitment to making a difference in this world and in this community. Father, I thank you for each one here tonight. I thank you that they took the time out of their busy days to come and be a part of something great. We thank you, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us all. We ask that each word, each thought, every everything that comes out tonight would bring glory to you and would build community. We ask for your wisdom, your strength, your power. Make us strong and courageous to do what is right and just. Lord, would you bless this time tonight, bless this city council meeting. And since I'm here at this appropriate moment, Lord, would you please bless Hank and Frank as they retire. Lord, give them health and happiness and joy and all that they seek in their new adventures. Lord, bless the city of Norco, Horsetown, USA, and God bless America. Amen. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to add an emergency agenda item to tonight's uh, council meeting uh, regarding a letter regarding SB 50 to Senator Roth. Okay, 
Uh, motion to do that. Are you making a motion? I'm making a motion, yes. We have a motion and a second. I'll uh, let the clerk do the roll call there. <clears throat> Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Grunmeyer? Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, now we do that at the end of the after the meeting. Okay, the next, next item on the agenda is uh, <coughs> business appreciation. And I'm going to walk down there. I'll call up uh, Chairman of the EDAC uh, Committee, Patrick Malone, to join me down at the podium. Yeah, so Robert and uh, Mac want to come up here, please? <clears throat> so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, um, we're here to assist Mayor, I'm here to assist Mayor Hanna with the presentation of this month's business appreciation in Norco Lube and Tune. Uh, that was founded in the 60s and, and about 20 years ago, Mac and his partner Robert acquired it and um, remodeled everything and it's been happy ever since, right? So. Okay. My pleasure to present this plaque to the Norco Lube and Tune for demonstrating the value of local ownership, investing in Six Streets architectural western theme, and building a loyal clientele in Horsetown, USA. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, we much appreciate uh, this town. Uh, moved here about 20 years ago from East Anaheim Hills, and uh, they used to have horses back in uh, the 60s, and uh, came over to this town and loved it. And I'm not looking back. I'm not looking to leave. Unless it gets really bad in California, I'm going to Texas. <laughs> But for now, we love Norco, and we love everybody in Norco. We get along with everybody, and uh, we're happy that we got this award. People acknowledge us. Uh, we're very honest at the shop. Thank Again, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, I have a recognition. This is kind of a sad deal for some of us in the city. These guys are good, good friends and good workers, but the retirement of Animal Control Superintendent Frank Skagged. Frankie, I've known you 20 years. I can't pronounce your name right. <laughs> and the Parks and, and Parks and Building Superintendent Hank Koch. You gentlemen come up, and I'll, I'll refer this as the... Uh, Hank and Frank show. <laughs> <laughs> Start out with uh, Hank's. Hank Koch, <clears throat> he's uh, been an employee, outstanding employee for 18 years in the Parks and Recs Division, taking care of uh, building and uh, overseeing the outside workers. And uh, he's a real dedicated uh, person, a good person to work for. And uh, Hank, go to miss you, partner. Absolutely. Thank you, Vincent. Here's yours. Appreciate it. 
Frank, yeah. Frank uh, I held his a little longer. He's been here longer. <laughs> but the uh, city of Norco proudly are hereby recognized Frankie. And uh, for 33 years of outstanding and dedicated service to residents of Norco and uh, <clears throat> November 1986 to December 2019. And uh, I'll tell you about these two guys. I've dealt with them for a long time. They're real dedicated uh, as uh, one of the team leaders of the NART team. I could call Frankie any time, day or night, get a response, get his help to go rescue an animal and everything. A real dedicated person and the same with uh, Hank. He is on the team and uh, call him any time, day or night and he was willing to come and help us and gentlemen we really appreciate your service thank you thank you did you guys all want to come down <laughs> down here and get the picture made with yeah. you <laughs> they're gonna fit in your moving van <laughs> I can find a whole other <laughs> thank you sir appreciate that we all need to get <laughs> We need to get out there in the front, folks, for the whatever you want to photo. Hank. Uh, we are still recruiting for both of those two positions. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we are. Who's going to be harassing me about the animal yeah. control stuff? Uh, yeah, we've got <laughs> two outside candidates. I know. Always is. <laughs> Just to both of you, that Frank, especially with all your help with animal control and NART, and with you also, Hank, and like I said, you you've been my buddy since day one, and. I think it was 20 years ago when he was just a young, frail, <laughs> clean-shaven boy <laughs> begging a previous council to, uh, you know, help him with his first home. So, um, not only are we uh, going to miss you as employees, but as members of our community. I appreciate it. So. Thank you so much, sir. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. You're not the shy one. So I just want to say real quickly, <clears throat> it's been my honor and privilege to work for the city of Narco. Uh, I was raised in Narco, raised my family in Narco. They all graduated from the Narco schools. And I'm just blessed to, uh, to be able to stay here in Narco for at least the uh, next few years before I possibly move somewhere else. But um, I'll be around, I'll be at City Hall, I'll be at the animal shelter still. Um, give it back, because that's, I think Norco is all about is about volunteerism and giving back to the community. Thank you all. Uh, I want to thank you also uh, individually, but also the city. I mean, years ago when in 2001 when we came to the United States from the Netherlands, and I never expected to be hired by the city, but hey, you guys were crazy enough to do it. And uh, but I loved every bit of it, and yeah, ups and downs, a roller coaster. Work is always life isn't like it, but there is no better place than Norco, and I want to thank you all for that. Appreciate it.
I have one more introduction here. Uh, Mona, I'll pro probably butcher your name, I hope not. Mona McLoath, the new owner of Miss Norco and Corona Pageants. Gary and Arlene Lewis, would you come up and uh, introduce her to the folks in the city, please? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just say a few things. Um, Oh, this is a very uh, whoa 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 can you hear me um i'll let her say her first and her last name because i'll murder the last name too you you said it pretty well <laughs> good evening my name is mona mcclough and uh, very happy to be here tonight and i'm so excited to be taking over um although i have some pretty big shoes to fill these two ran the Miss Norco pageant um, in recent years and did an amazing job. The, the Miss Norco pageant, as you can see, represented by our ladies here tonight, recognizes beautiful and intelligent young ladies who go out in their year reign and do community service in their prospective cities and beyond. And uh, they've been involved in so much community service and um, volunteer work and they've attended city functions. And um, that's all from what Gary and Arlene had started. And so I hope I can do half the job that they did, but I am so, so excited to be taking over this new venture. And, uh, and I thank the city of Norco for welcoming us and everything that you have done for these girls and for the Miss Norco pageant. Thanks for having us tonight. No, I just and I just wanted to thank uh, City Council, uh, City Manager, all the professional staff that's here that have that have backed us and supported us these years. And this year, since we had our pageant at the end of August, I know that we have attended more than 85 events. So it's a pretty pretty busy year for our girls. And and no one said it better than I think it was uh, Frank. It's all about volunteerism and having that sincere desire and to have that at the young age and to teach them to give back to the community is an awesome awesome feeling so uh, we thank everyone and we're not leaving as yet we'll still be in the area and we'll still be attending events yeah say a few things <laughs> um, we started this adventure when um, I saw the on Pumpkin Rock it said bring back Miss Narco and Gary had retired from the police department and I had went to him right away and I said what do you think if we bring it back and he said yes and I right away went and started doing the process because one I was shocked he said yes and I knew if I didn't start it right away he would have just you know went backwards anyways we went through a lot and you all know what we went through I grew up in Norco. I've been here since 1968. Grandma owned a restaurant called Trina's Mexican Food. Rode my horses just like everybody else, except we didn't pay for the insurance on the horses. You didn't have to have the best of the best. Rode my horse to Pete's, Pete Liquor. Remember Pete's Liquor? Yes, rode my horse there, bought him a chunky bar and a Coke. But the vet said, don't do that no more. <laughs> Anyways, uh, long story short, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, we are passing the reins over to Miss Mona, and we hope that she will continue to do everything that we have um, done. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Ladies. Come on over and don't get in the phone. Come over here. Can. Pretend like okay. you like me. You can squeeze in. Little ones in front. Little ones in front. Come here, baby. Watch that crown go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin will still be around. Yeah. For a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, now we'll go on to the City Council communications reports on regional boards and commissions, and uh, we'll start off with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bash. I uh, went to a lot of meetings. Uh, the, the two, uh, I think the key one, which I don't think I put on there, is uh, we had the advisory committee for Norco College, and um, <clears throat> they're really looking to pass that bond. Um, I'm actually going to support it because I'm concerned about the... Uh, I'm very, very concerned with the fact that they're looking at a huge unemployment uh, in Riverside County. Some people say as high as 50% due to the $15 an hour in automation. And so I'm very concerned uh, that people will not have a way to train for new jobs. Right now, the opportunities are a very expensive private school that these sort of, uh, the different ones in these big office buildings. And then you've got your community college system. So because they're, they're being up that um, sort of work level retraining, retooling of workers, um, I'm going to be supporting that bond. I, I don't know what's going to happen. They literally vote on it in six weeks. Um, I'm not real happy with a lot of things going on with the district, but I really do feel that we need to make sure that people, when these robots take over, have an opportunity to find a way to get a job. And then uh, <clears throat> the Navy rebuttal goes on. Uh, we met with uh, a, a architectural historian that was very interesting. Um, right now, between Bill Wolkman and I, we got about 300 hours in work on re replying to an 18-page letter. And so I'll keep you guys posted on that. And by the way, today the mayor was excellent at the Norco Chamber of Commerce meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Even, I even learned a bunch of stuff. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, so, since the last meeting, you can see what I've done up there, mostly uh, finishing up um, guest speaking at a couple of uh, community meetings, and that's it. Oh, that's a new format. Um, I've been busy, like I said, uh, what I have up there, but I just want to, uh, my uh, most important thing is to remind people that on uh, January 27th, uh, we're going to have a person from the Western Community Energy at our uh, town hall meeting, and our launch date for that is coming up soon, and we are projecting a 2% uh, saving on your electric bill. So it's a good idea to come in and find about how you belong to the WCE, which is going to start here uh, in April. So please come to our January 27th meeting so you can actually ask your questions. Then um, <coughs> Yesterday I attended the uh, meeting at the uh, California Rehabilitation Center at the prison and uh, they are out probably over their maximum. They have 3,600 inmates there. Uh, we've heard rumors for years, uh, just like I heard them, just like the rest of you. Oh, they're going to close it down, going to close it down, going to close it down. Well, if they're going to close it down, they're investing a lot of money into it right now. So I probably for at least the next year, it's going to be there. Uh, the um, They have a new associate warden, uh, deputy warden. Uh, uh, the current uh, warden, uh, Cynthia Tampkins, is uh, projected to retire in December of this year, and so uh, several new people are going to come in and try to take over her position. But they have new staff, uh, big staff changeover uh, because of that, a lot of retirees out there. But they are the state is spending uh, the new medical unit along with some new housing unit there. So at this point, it doesn't look like they're going to close. Uh, so whatever you read in the paper, you hear in the news, uh, they're rumors. But uh, again, it's the state, so they do things impulsively too. So it just depends what side, the way, where the wind is blowing, what they do with that place. But at this point, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I did want to make one comment about the, the Hall of Fame uh, the ceremony on Saturday night that Kevin you did a great job as the master of ceremonies and um, he was a horse though Mr. Ed yeah I know <laughs> so you did a good job Kevin 
and it was very well attended. Um, last Thursday I attended the uh, special board meeting for the uh, Chino Basin DeSalter and just a quick update and it's probably more of a to help us with traffic. Uh, we have a, approximately a $27 million uh, raw, raw water pipeline project that is running from uh, in East Vale, Europa Valley. It's running from Archibald all the way down Belgrave uh, under the bridge uh, on the 15 freeway and then all the way up to uh, Wineville. So you may see that may have some traffic impacts uh, completions hopefully is going to be in May and June of, of this year but we'll, we'll see how that shakes out and then the other is just an informational um, item that I don't know if anyone's noticed when you cross the bridge on Hamner Avenue and look down to the Silver Lakes first parking area you're gonna see a small leakage that's a pretty good size and the water line that we ran underneath the river uh, where it makes a transition from steel pipe to um, uh, plastic pipe basically it's a 30 inch water line the the gasket is failing and so that uh, we tried tightening up all the bolts in that and it's it's not it has to be replaced so th that uh, will be coordinated with uh, Chad and Public Works um, to shut down that water line and uh, repair it before it becomes a really big geyser in the air and then you will notice it. Um, Chad, did you have anything to add to that? Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Last week we toured the new Wood Spring Suites Hotel and uh, that's quite a hotel over there. It's for people that need the extended stay like are working jobs in the area for more than one day and everything. And we had uh, the NART training, and I don't know if you know or not, but we got a MOU with the uh, County of Riverside where we can work with the Riverside County Animal Services. And if they need us to come help them, we can go over there. If we, if they, we need more help, we can call them. But uh, they're coming to training. Last week we had 18 of those from the County Animal thing at our training, so they're all interested in coming. Monday I attended the uh, League of California Cities in San Jacinto with the rest of the council people here. And on, uh, I think it was the 29th of December, Sunday night, we stood by at the Equifest over at Burbank at the LA Equestrian Center with our horse ambulance. That's, that's where uh, all the horses in the Rose Parade have to come and participate that day, and they're actually on RFD TV. It's quite a quite a deal. We get to see all the horses and and uh, riders and carriages and things up uh, up close, and we'll let video play there. Here comes America's uh, number one hitch. I call them. Can y'all recognize them there? That's the Budweiser team. Budweiser Clydesdale, they're going out into the arena to do their uh, performance and they put on quite a bit of, quite a show in there with that. And then on New Year's Day, we stood by at the Rose Parade. We're parked on top of a bridge on Del Mar, on top of a freeway there where they, the freeway is blocked off underneath there. It's where all the horses are staged overnight to come into the parade. We had to be there on that bridge no later than 5, 5.30 in the morning and it's nice and chilly there. But uh, this year we didn't have any incidents. You got the next slide there. Here's a, where we're standing there's a vacant lot. The horses ride across, they ride up the ramp coming off that freeway and they ride up uh, across this bridge come by us and uh, they go into a vacant lot and they go down there about two blocks and they get in there line up 
period and the, and the reason I like being parked here was like where I was standing at Equifest up above everything, myself and Buzz, we take note of all the horses that are acting up, that are nervous. Now there goes the Marine Color Guard on their uh, Mustangs, they're always a big attraction and everything, but these horses all start coming by, it's just a little after daylight going to uh, line up, but we uh, we stand there and make notes of the nervous horses at Equifest because they're probably going to be nervous at the parade if they're nervous there. And then we check them again on uh, parade day and uh, same five horses that was nervous at the Equifest, was nervous at the parade when they come to us, but they were all good in the parade. Last year we had to pick two of them up and take them to the end of the parade because they couldn't get them get them down the street because I think they were placed right in front of a band or something but we had to haul them almost from the beginning to the end and we had to go along towards the end of the parade in case something else happened so we was along there for about what two hours Ted 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 and Buzz was in the back of the trailer holding these <laughs> guys but uh, anyway we we do that it's a uh, it's a lot of fun and then Vector they're continuing spraying the areas for uh, West Nile. West Nile's bad right now, and it's going to get worse when it warms up because of all the rains and the mosquitoes. So be sure and prepare your animals for the disease. RTA is maintaining its ridership, and. Uh, Right now, we're conducting a study on how to prepare for the upcoming re requirements on how to switch the, out all the buses to battery-operated buses, which I think they have to have the whole fleet done by 2030. And those buses cost about a million bucks a piece, so we don't know what's going to happen there. And one more thing on RTA, I didn't put it down there, but we have a new route coming in, uh, Route 4. It will start over at Costco, Amazon Center in Eastvale, and it'll come down to Limonite, come down to Archibald, come down through uh, Norco, and then to Corona. So it's going to make access for people to be able to take the bus and go like from Corona Norco drive, uh, go over to the Costco area. I think they have a Smart and Final. They're talking about putting in a Walmart over there so people could ride the bus and go shopping over there. And the construction on the 91, I mean on the 15 Freeway Express Lane projects moving right along. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is the City Council consent items. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and may be enacted by one motion. Prior to the motion to sponsor any action by, or to consider any action by the Council, any public comments on any of the consent items will be heard. There will be no separate action unless members of the council or the audience request specific items be removed from the consent calendar. Items from the consent calendar will be considered separately under item three. So do we have any, anybody wants to pull any items? Pull C and G, please. G, did you say? Yes, G's and George. Okay, any more? Okay, do we have Move to approve the rest. Wait a second. <laughs> do we have any uh, speaker cards from the audience? There are no speaker cards. Okay, so then we'll accept the motion. Second. I have a motion to approve the rest of the items. Please vote.
Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item, item C, <coughs> acceptance of the Hamner widening project from 3rd to 5th Street. Who pulled that? I didn't. Ted? Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, this is a really... Uh, my, I don't have to complain about the project, uh, but I do want to uh, probably stress to uh, Chad and his crew, and, and we really need to work on the improvement on that 5th and Hamner corner of the, uh, that would be the uh, south west corner. I know that you didn't get permission or the easement granted and things like that, but over the next couple of years, we need to either talk to the property owners or there. That, if for the residents to know, we, we did not improve that because we did not get approval from the uh, property owners there to improve that corner right in front of the, uh, the old Tuna Masters and the restaurant. But it really creates a traffic bog there. I know that once the hotel goes in there, it will hopefully on the other side, that corner will be fixed. But I appreciate what you guys did there, but we really need to work on that for future to make sure that that part of that section is it just, it doesn't flow well through there. That was just all I had to comment on. Thank you. I, I have a question on that uh, same item, Chad. Uh, the section of street from 4th going north towards the animal hospital did, did we not get right away on that to widen that area there that, that one little arm that sticks out no we were having a lot of difficulty getting uh, consistent meetings or even dialogue with the owner there's actually three parcels there uh, we have one of them uh, the other two uh, we just couldn't get anything moving with the property owner plus there's also the Edison power lines that are there would have to be adjusted uh, we also determined that would be about a quarter million dollars to adjust those poles down because they're up on an elevated hill um, so there that was also a financial issue uh, that would we would have also had to resolve but we couldn't even get the property in the first place but we tried okay and then the other end of it down there by Phil Street where the uh Holiday Inn Express is going to go. That'll be fixed by them. Is that correct? Correct. They'll do improvements on the, the Hamner side and the Fifth Street side. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. All right, Ted. Did you want to make a motion? Yeah. With that, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Have a motion and a second. Uh, <coughs> please vote. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Item D, uh, installation of the electric vehicle charging station at City Hall parking lot. Is that yours, Greg? Yes, sir. Okay. Roger, since Brian's not here, are you handling this? <clears throat> I'll do my best. You always do. Uh, fairly simple. So, um, one, I want to compliment you, Brian, on uh, moving forward with these chargers at uh, City Hall. Uh, I guess one of my first questions was on these proposals. When did you change the spelling on your name? Oh. It, so... I put the D? Yeah, it, yeah, and they both was a swing and a miss. Uh, I wanted to compliment you and uh, Brian on on these proposals and how you went through them because it's always a concern to me when a contractor gives you eight items that's included and 17 items that are excluded. Uh, that's always a flag. But um, my basic question that I couldn't find an answer to was who pays for the electricity? How is that reimbursed since this, the, the system is going to be tied to our electrical system and where does that is that money reimbursable and where does it come from yes it's it'll be on a separate meter um, it's charged at a lower rate uh, than than what they charge for City Hall <coughs> excuse me or other facilities other city facilities and then we are reimbursed to the um, the usage of these chargers. So everybody that uses these chargers, it's a, um, a network called uh, ChargePoint. Mm -hmm. They have 100,000 chargers across the country, around the world actually. And uh, so it, 
you let's say you're driving up the 15 from, from from Temecula, you know, to Vegas. You need to you need to get a charge. You can check your app. You see there's one in Dorco at City Hall. You can pull in, and for that 45 minutes that it takes to get a full charge, um, you you are are charged a fee that uh, is pa much of it is passed on to the city. Uh, each charger is anticipated at normal usage uh, to um, generate about $500 a month. Uh, so over the course of five years, we re we'd recoup our entire uh, matching funds. Okay. So, and beyond that, it becomes a, a profit center. And the, the charge point, then they, like monthly or whatever, we're, we're paying Edison? Correct. And then we're in re reimbursed? Is there, is that automatic or do we have to have it, somebody send them the bill and all no, of that? No, it becomes automatic. Okay, yeah. all right. So that was my big point, where, where was the reimbursable coming from? So, but a good job, it's well needed. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, at the expense of three parking spaces, it's it's a good investment. It's a good start. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. G, also yours, Greg? No, sir. No, that was mine. Oh, Ted, okay. Uh, yeah, the reason I pulled that, uh, this is uh, the last and final uh, extension on the property, and I know that staff and along with some council members have been working very hard trying to figure out what, and I just want to continue uh, Steve, yours, and Roger, and Chad's, and the staff's <coughs> work diligently with uh, the Dilopis and management. So we don't. We need to figure out what to do with it. I mean, it's. I I I know he's sitting there back here in the back, and I don't know if they want to say anything, but it's one of those things that this is a, a crucial property that we have on our track map, and we want to ensure and protect what we have here in Norco along with their investment. So. Unless they want to speak, I, it's up to the council, the mayor, if he doesn't mind. Yeah, come on up. Oh well, thanks, uh, and um, appreciate uh, uh, the comment, uh, 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 Councilperson uh, Hoffman. And we've we'd like to try to get our project developed. And I, I, obviously, we've we've met with most of the council at this point in time, and we're trying to find solutions. Um, you know, just the way the project's designed, the uh, half acre lots are expensive to develop, and there's access issues, and there's frontage issues, as everybody knows. So we're I think everyone's been helpful, uh, Chad, Steve, and everyone that's been involved in the process, trying to find solutions. Uh, and so we'll we'll keep working at that. We know this is our last extension, and and uh, if we can't figure something out here this year to kick it off, then we're gonna we'll lose our entitlement and kind of start over with something. So we're we're open to continue to work and try to figure out how we can get the project going. Thank you. Thanks. Ted, you want to make a motion? Berwin, yeah, with that, if no one else has a comment, make a motion to approve the extension. I have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. All right, item four is public comments. This is the time when persons in the audience wishing to address the City Council regarding matters not on the agenda may speak. Please complete, complete the speaker card in the back of the room and present to the City Clerk so that you may be recognized. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits City Council's ability to respond to comments on non-agendized matters at the time such comments are made. The City Council shall not discuss or take action relative to any general public comment. Do we have any cards? Yes, first speaker card is Bill Naylor. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, in keeping with the theme of earlier of volunteerism, I thought I w would take just a minute to thank a number of people and groups for their assistance. First of all, I'd like to thank Chad for uh, letting us know that they were going to be removing the chain or the trail fencing along Pedley, and if we needed wanted any of the materials, that we would be able to go do that. We were able to assemble about 15 volunteers this last Saturday, uh, members both from Grace Fellowship, Norco Horsemen's Association, and just general public at large, and we were able to retrieve uh, somewhere in the area of about 100 posts and 200 rails, and they are almost all usable. So we have those stored, and we probably have enough work now, or enough materials now for the next two or three years to make repairs. I know just in those last few days, uh, uh, I, we've noticed that there was at least three rails that we had to replace, and we went got already gone out and done that on Sixth Street, Valley View, and on Third Street. Um, I kind of want to thank all those groups that did help us up with that. Also, in keeping with volunteerism, I know that a number of people did volunteer to help with the uh, Christmas festival that we had up at Nellie Weaver and Ingalls, and that was a fantastic program with a parade and the event, and a lot of volunteers were worked on that, so again, I'd like to thank them for that. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Bonnie Slager. Good evening, Council. Um, I would like to invite all of you on March 14th to Norco Horseman's Casino Night. It's March 14th, Saturday at Nellie Weaver Hall. This is our annual fundraiser to raise money for scholarships for high school students. Last year, we were able to give eight $1,000 scholarships to graduating seniors, and so I hope we can uh, do as well this year, but it depends on uh, obviously people coming to the event and uh, helping us sponsor it so I hope that's on everybody's calendar and also tomorrow night is our monthly Norco Horsemen's Association meeting and our Mayor Hannah is our speaker so uh, if you want to hear him speak again tomorrow night it's your opportunity thank you thanks Bonnie there are no further speaker cards thank you everybody that spoke all right uh, Item 5 is legislative matters. No new evidence will be heard from the public at the, as the public hearing has been closed regarding the items listed. City Attorney. No. Mm -hmm. just, just need a motion. Just need a motion then. Motion to second. We have a motion and a second. I'm sorry, we'll have to take a verbal roll call for this one. Um, Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Grummeyer? Yes. Councilmember Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Item six is City Council discussion items. Order of presentation for discussion items to staff report presentation, council questions of staff and applicant, public speakers in favor against and neutral, and council discussion and action. Item A is a report on fiscal year 2019 audited financial reports from the acting finance director. Was that? Hi, good evening. Uh, we have here our, to receive and file our fiscal year 2019 um, audited financial reports. We have um, Mr. Rob Callanan for, to give a quick presentation on them. City Council, uh, my name is Bob Callanan. I'm with White Nelson D11s. We were the audit firm firm who prepare, uh, perform audit services on your city's financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2019. 
just brief outline it looks long but it won't I, I won't make it long because I know you have other uh, important things to discuss as well but briefly go over the scope of services what our audit opinion was my required co uh, communications that I'm obligated to share with you under the auditing standards and then finally a brief uh, synopsis on upcoming uh, GASB standards GASB governmental accounting standards board uh, that will impact your uh, financial reporting in the future the scope of services basically was to do an audit of your financial statements in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and as well as governmental audit standards. We did an agreed upon procedures review of the city's GAN limit, that's the appropriations limit that is uh, adopted annually. Uh, we d we uh, were um, tasked with doing a single audit of the city's federal programs, but we did not have to do that this year because there's a threshold of 750,000 in expenditures, and if you don't go above that, there's not a requirement to file a single audit. So just wanted to make you aware that that was in the original scope of services, but the expenditure level, which we did look at and verify, did not uh, give rise to the need for a single audit. And then lastly, uh, we had a new item in the scope of services this year, was an audit of the Measure R annual financial statements because the city did start to receive some Measure R funding during the year. Our auditor's opinion is for the year ended June 30, 2019. Just point out that management is responsible for the fair presentation of the financial statements and our responsibility is to express opinions on those financial statements. And opinions is plural because if you look at the financial statements, there are several columns and each column essentially I'm giving an opinion on each separate column and then everything as a whole. So that just gives you a little lower layer of uh, materiality and, and looking at things. And then uh, we're required to plan and perform the audit to make sure that the numbers before you that are in that financial statements and the footnote disclosures are fairly stated and there, there's no material misstatements in there. So our audit opinion was an unmodified opinions for June 30, 2019. That's the highest form of opinion that can be provided under the, uh, <coughs> under the auditing standards. So they call it a clean opinion. A lot of people will say clean opinion. We also, as part of this, uh, the governmental auditing standards are required to report if there were any material weaknesses or material non-compliance matters that uh, we came across during the course of our audit. And I'm pleased to report that uh, we did not identify any material weaknesses in internal control and we did not come across any material non-compliance matters. I want to point out that we do annually send an engagement letter to management and it essentially communicates the scope of services that I laid out before you as well as uh, some planning letter to get some more information as to how to go about our audit because it is risk-based approach so it changes from year to year. We have standard audit procedures that we do every year like I audit, our firm audits 100% of cash and investments every year no matter what. But there's other areas that, you know, just depending on facts and circumstances for a given year may give rise to doing some more audit procedures in, a, in an area that may not have happened in, a, in another year. Uh, management is responsible for the select selection and use of accounting policies and the significant accounting policies in the financial statement notes, footnote one, that's where you'll find those significant accounting policies. I uh, want to point out that those policies during the course of our audit did not change from prior years. It was consistent from one year to the next and there was no implementation of any new auditing standards or auditing requirements for June 30, 2019. I want to point out that the financial statements do contain significant estimates. I've listed them on this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I think the key ones or the, the ones that have the, the most impact have to do with the uh, net pension liabilities related to the CalPERS defined benefit plans as well as the city's other post-employment benefit plan. Uh, those have some extended footnote disclosures in the notes that can give you some more information as how those estimates were derived and uh, just be aware that uh, subsequent to my issuing the report there were no major changes uh, that need to come to your attention related to those. These disclosures, as I said, note five is your net pension liability related to CalPERS defined benefit plans. Note 12 is the OPEB plans. And then obviously 11, risk management has to do with your general liability and workers' comp estimates. I would please to report that we had no difficulties in performing our audit. 
we did have a few audit adjustments and management agreed to uh, record them. None of those adjustments, uh, either individually or in the aggregate, were material to the financial statements. Uh, we had no disagreements with management on any uh, issues or matters. Uh, we do obtain a representation letter from management to, that uh, essentially says that they've uh, provided us uh, un unfettered access to anything we needed, any employees we needed to talk to in order for us to perform our auditing services. And to our knowledge, I have to, to uh, inform you if I believe there's opinion shopping going on, and I'm pleased to report there was no opinion shopping going on because there was no issues <laughs> that we uh, disagreed on. New standards coming, uh, there were implement, implementations in 18, uh, fiscal year 1819. I, I misspoke earlier, I said there was no standards. There were a couple. Uh, they were very minor in relationship. Uh, the, the matter of fact, GASB Statement 83 did not apply to the city, but I just wanted to make you aware that it was implement, implemented because it could in the future impact the city's reporting if you have the uh, requirements uh, for that. And GASB 88 really was some uh, language changing and a few additional note disclosures related to the long-term debt uh, of the city. And so it was just changing up the uh, footnote with wording a little bit primarily. So very minor, I didn't uh, feel that it was significant enough to warrant uh, uh, an emphasis of matter in my audit opinion. And then down the road, uh, 18, uh, for fiscal year 1920, uh, the big one is going to be the fiduciary activities. Uh, you have before you in the financial statements uh, a section in the front uh, called fiduciary funds. And there will be a new requirement to add a uh, additional statement in there on the fiduciary funds that will show additions and deletions to every fiduciary fund that's in there, an agency fund. That currently right now just shows you a, a balance sheet of what the agency funds are. It also requires the, the city management to go through the uh, what's existing in the agency fund and the fiduciary funds to make sure that it's truly assets and liabilities related to entities outside the city of Norco itself, meaning that they, there's no own source revenue in there that needs to be reported in the city, that it's truly the uh, city acting in a fiduciary capacity for other organizations and, and so forth. So that's going to take some uh, time for management to, to check to see, yes, everything is there is fine. Uh, I also am on a state committee, uh, government accounting and auditing committee, and we're trying to issue a white paper to supplement the standard for California enti entities. And we are uh, struggling with some of the uh, language in the GASB standard as it relates to whether we need to be reporting in there the pen uh, as pension trust funds related to the OPEB uh, plan that you have and possibly the uh, pension funds. So it's uh, it, it's not as clear going through the wording and we're still working on that and hope to have that white paper out in the next couple months to help uh, municipalities and other special districts be able to comply appropriately with the note disclosure requirements. So with that, I'd just open it up if you had any questions for me related to the, the audit. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Council have any questions? No. Look like you got off easy. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I keep mentioning that I'm going to come and wear my bolo ties because I do own three and I, I will, I'll dispense with the hat because I'm not appropriately dressed in cowboy, my cowboy boots and my jeans, but this is my third council meeting in three nights, so it's the end, the end of the road for this week. So uh, I apologize for not having a bolo tie on to represent Horsetown and uh, uh, my wife's a, 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 a a former horseman, horse showman uh, from Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan and Indiana. And unfortunately we couldn't bring our horse out here uh, at the time. So I'm hoping uh, now that the kids are out of the house that we uh, start going for some more uh, area where I can do some golfing and she can do some, some horsemanship. Well, it's okay to wear your hat with bikinis or whatever. <laughs> no, no, that, that would not be a good sight. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for the information. Mr. Mayor, if I could uh, make a couple of comments yes, sir. before you receive and file this document. Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to uh, thank thank the auditors for their work and their timely ad advice to city staff uh, with respect to uh, uh, the audit. But most importantly, I do want to thank uh, the finance staff in Lisette and her team uh, for compiling all the financial statements. Uh, this is a, 
uh, truly a year-long process and I also want to express my gratitude to the rest of staff because they are also involved in that process and for those in the audience I do want to bring to your attention the city's actual financial statements uh, what the auditor has presented here is the uh, uh, the obligations under the audit, uh, the actual documents that presents information with respect to the city's uh, financial operations as well as financial condition as of June 30, 2019, uh, uh, contained in this uh, comprehensive annual financial report uh, is available on the city website and it contains a lot of information uh, with respect to city funds and accounts. Uh, I encourage you to read it. These are not your typical budget this is not a budget document I know a lot of people are interested in reading reading budget documents but the actual information in terms of where the city stands uh, financially at the end of every every fiscal year uh, is contained in this document so it is an important document and to assist you with the understanding of the numbers in the document we have uh, included uh, notes we have uh, included uh, uh, management discussions and an and analysis pertaining to the financial statement as well as transmittal level. <coughs> Again, a very important document uh, is on the city website. I encourage you to, uh, to read it. And the city council, we appreciate your support in, in making this happen as well. No problem. Anybody else got anything to say? Uh, Mayor, I'd just like to comment, uh, reiterate what the uh, city manager said. And when I was reading through this, and I saw the, I highlighted the, all the sections in there. And I, this is a compliment to uh, Lizette and her team. Uh, no exceptions are noted as a result of performing this procedure from the auditor. That means a lot, uh, because especially when this auditor's report says no material weaknesses were identified and no material noncompliance was identified, uh, that means that this city's financial uh, officers and uh, people and staff are doing a good job and uh, it's a credit to Andy your direction along with uh, Lizette and your team so thank you thank you very much and we do appreciate everything you guys do over there Lizette yeah. thank you very much okay we need a motion and a second right all right, please vote. Please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Item B is reservoir number one replacement initial study and proposed mitigated negative declaration. This is a combination between the planning director and the public uh, works director. Who wants to be first? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. This is a project that's already part of the CIP and has been funded <coughs> and obviously approved by the city council. One of the one of the items that's required is an environmental analysis and determination, uh, a mitigated or an in, an in, excuse me, an initial study was prepared and the conclusion was that a mitigated negative declaration be adopted. So that's the action before the city council tonight to adopt the mitigated negative declaration. The only potential issues that were identified, um, there was no indication of any impact on site. Uh, there, were, there was only potential impact to uh, birds and uh, if if construction occurred during the nesting season, which is September to, I forget what it is, September to March, or, and there's adequate mitigation measures in there to protect those species should they be, should construction occur within those time periods. And the only other potential impact was the potential to find uh, archeological, uh, things on the property once grading starts. They didn't find any, any indication that there were any there because of the disturbed nature of the property, but they, there is a condition that will protect those resources should they be found. And based upon those and the rest of the, the analysis, the determination was that a mitigated negative declaration be adopted. 
And with that, I'll conclude and let Chad say something. And just to clarify, for that project, it's already an existing reservoir up on the hill. Uh, it's on a, basically a granite hill, um, but they're going to basically um, demolish that reservoir, regrade it basically about a foot or two um, to, to re, uh, reestablish the site, and then build a larger reservoir on site. It's more wider capacity, so going from 2 million to 3 million gallons to give us more storage. So that's why, as far as the mini native deck, they don't expect any issues because it's already a developed location. Um, but it still will require um, a uh, tribal monitor because um, that's under uh, the laws. Uh, they've submitted a note indicating they want to be present during the grading period. And that's the only time they're supposed to be present uh, to see if anything is discovered or disturbed. So we will have a, an agreement with the uh, local tribe to uh, send a representative to basically stand and monitor and watch the grading to see if any um, historical archaeological things are discovered. But we don't expect that since that location is just a rock. Um, but we are obliged to do that by state law. Thank you. Uh, questions up here? Anyone? What year was that built? <clears throat> Why is it called number one? I believe those were in the 50s. Would have been after 57. That wasn't the first one, though, was it? it well, I don't know if it's the first one that's labeled. There was two the that first were built. one was the one over here by the Mormon church. There was two that were built around the same time. I think it was 57 or 58, yeah, something around the there. Yeah, the Community Services District. So it's over 50 years old. Yeah. Well, so it's historic in and of itself. Oh, don't. <laughs> Okay, I'm just kidding. I want to hear a motion to put it on the register. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, I have one for uh, Chad. This is the the uh, the tank by the uh, Wiley property, correct? Correct. There's no problems with the Wiley property and contamination when you're grading or anything like that. It should not affect that. No, because we're just grading the same existing pad where the reservoir okay. sits now. Because it's not going to. There is a plume that goes down there. I just don't want to go. We're not going to be touching that area, correct? We're, we're not even entering any Wiley property. No, but the plume goes beyond the Wiley property. Right. That's going there. Okay. Well, yeah, it's on the hill, but if you go down towards El Paso, where that that water, where the uh, as you go down where that uh, repairing area is, we're not even touching that, right? Nope. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, Bert. Greg. <laughs> couple of parts to this is um, Steve if you recall this is years ago on that tank our for uh, former planning commissioner Jim Mercer okay mm -hmm. and Kevin you know him yeah you will all right One half of a horse. that <laughs> yeah if, if you if you lease half of a pony you can run for council so um, <laughs> But if you remember, he had access, he had granted us some type of access off of his property, and he, he played us pretty well to, to go up to this well, all right? So, and, and the reservoir, and, there, and, and work was being done at, at that time. You kind of remember that from forever ago? Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get around to, why do we have to have a tribal monitor on this Okay, because that that would have been taken care of a long time ago. What's the trigger on how many yards are you moving? How, what area of excavation is triggering that cost to have that monitored when we're going to be paying a thousand dollars a day for that guy to sit out there and do absolutely zero? Yeah, unfortunately, the trigger is that we have to do an uh, AB 52 consultation if we're doing anything within the, the historical range of the tribes that lay claim to Southern California. Uh, and if they request it, they get it. That's, that's the bottom line. But there's something else. I mean, but you don't have to do that on every project or size. There's something that 
well, triggers it, that, whether it's... It's really the grading. If we're disturbing the site, if we were, for example, taking the reservoir down and building it on the existing surface without any grading, disturbing of the area, uh, my understanding is we wouldn't uh, be obligated to provide um, a request uh, for monitoring. It's really because of the grading that's occurring um, is why they want to make sure that if there's anything disturbed and, and sacred on that location, uh, that they have a monitor there. And it's pretty much almost on every project now. They're, they're putting in, we, when we do the AV52 uh, notifications, we come back with at least one request to have a monitor on site. What tribe is it? Yeah, the Ipachanga tribe. I had to have three here recently, oh. so that's why I'm aggravated with it. Right. We send them out to all of them um, so far consistently. We've usually only got them from the, 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 the I can't even say it, the Senio? Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The Pachanga, I know Pachanga, the, that reference. I just so. didn't think this is a big enough area to trigger that. Yeah, it's really just about excavation, and now it's a requirement because of this type of project. Um, we have to do the analysis, and that's part of the environmental review. Because of the environmental that's required to determine if you can have a minimum negative deck, you have to do notifications to the tribes, and they have that ability to request it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, go ahead. So about 10 years ago, what happened is when they built in the hills, they plowed under a whole bunch of Indian artifacts because they said it was just a pass-through area. And so uh, Ginny Osterman, myself, and some people notified the Lusainu Indians that just down the hill from that is actually a former, not as big as the Temescal site down by Glen Ivy, but there was a village um, that was identified by the Southwest Museum back in the 40s. And so I think that may have triggered it. Um, and now the Lasenos, because what happened is so many developers did negative declarations. I mean, you were here. Um, I, I'm not that you were part of it, but they plowed under a whole bunch of stuff up in those hills. And there's still there's eight sites left up there that they've that we've mapped. Um, one was just destroyed, so they're very very. I don't know if this triggered it, but I do know they're aware of that site. I can't imagine though, because in the 50s they just lopped those two hills. They just lopped the tops off of them. But yeah, it's a good way to make money, you know. <clears throat> and I think it just went up to fifteen hundred bucks a day, didn't it? Fifteen hundred now. I don't even have the price yet. Yeah, it's fifteen fifteen eighty or something. But that's why right down the hill was a major village, just literally at the bottom of that hill. So. Okay. Do we have any uh, cards? <laughs> we have no speaker cards for this item. Okay, uh, bring it back to council. Do anybody else have any discussion about it? Uh, we'll have a motion. To approve. Second. Have a motion and a second to approve. Please vote. <coughs> motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Item C is Reservoir 8 and 9 and Booster Station Project Initial Study and Proposed Mitigated neg Negative Declaration. Once again, it's a deal, Planning Director and Public Works Director. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Some, uh, members of the City Council, this is like a ditto report. Um, different site. It's at the corner of Bluff and River Road. And it's different in that these are two new reservoirs as opposed to replacement of an existing reservoir. Uh, same issues were identified as potential impacts, although there was no evidence on site that there would be an impact. So the initial study identified the potential for the impacts to both, uh, again, nesting birds and uh, sensitive species that have been identified for protection. None of those were found on the site, but uh, mitigation measures have been added to, to protect those species should uh, evidence be found and should construction occur within the nesting period that we talked about with the last one. And again, also uh, the potential for finding archaeological 
resources. Once grading occurs, there are conditions in place to protect those resources. Consultation, again, is part of the project uh, when grading begins. Uh, with those conditions, again, the uh, conclusion of the initial study was that a mitigated negative declaration be adopted. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chen. Yeah, and this site, again, is, is well, similar, it's definitely different in that it is a, for the majority, it's an undeveloped property. So it has a lot more uh, potential things that need to be mitigated. A lot of more just really initial temporary construction related mitigations that will be in place, uh, you know, dust control um, and mitigation in that regards. But this one will, because of the fact, um, and the uh, consultant erred on the side of caution in it because it's, it clearly has been developed in part in their w existing wells that have been there in the past, you know, that, that were used um, well, long ago. Uh, so there has been some development, but not a true development that there might be historical um, uh, artifacts or items on the site. While they did an initial investigation, they, they and we had, they did some, um, some excavation areas just to do tests, uh, they didn't find anything other than one little item they found on the surface sitting there, which could have been transplanted uh, because, frankly, we use that site for all our our spoils materials and we dump it there from all over the city so it, you know so they decided uh, because of that is certain you're gonna have your your tribal monitor plus you're all, we're also required to hire um, and have on site during just the grading portion an archaeological monitor who will prepare a report regarding uh, any and all findings or non findings uh, related to the site and they'll be filed and, and submitted to the city um, and so there in this particular one we'll have two monitors one that we're hiring for um, that's a certified um, archaeologist and also the travel monitor that'll be there also. Thank you. Anybody got any questions or comments? I have a comment. So up until a year ago, the three hoods that were there, those were actually placed there by the Navy. Those were actually Navy wells. And that was actually where the hot springs originated. Um, and I can understand why the Los Enos, except that they use that hot springs, but that area has been so, you read in the 1930s and 20s where people were digging up pottery and all kinds of stuff. It was a semi, semi major village. And they're not even certain it was Los Enos, maybe San Gabriel Enos. Um, but is there anything left of those wells that maybe we could give to the historic? Because um, they kind of went down before I realized I would have liked to have gotten some photographs of them. Well, one of them we currently use as a non-potable well. We fill <coughs> a lake with it. So that do you have a do you have a hood? One of the old hoods still there? Um, I don't think so. Most of it's been just retrofitted. We put our own um, infrastructure over it to protect it and secure it. Uh, we'd have to check to see if there might be something on the ground out there, but yeah. most of the infrastructure above ground has all been knocked over and demolished. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, d generally speaking, just so you know, the, that when you do uh, water infrastructure, things like that, there are some sticklers, but the reality of Section 106, um, they really don't because those are things that are necessary to keep cities going and stuff. They're not generally considered historic. But if there's anything out there, valves or anything, because that is all original Navy stuff from uh, 40, 43, 44 when they hooked up to the wells. Um, if there's just something out there, it might be fun to give to the uh, our historic archive room. Okay. Yeah. We'll take a look before the any construction starts. Yeah, yeah, I'm not and trust me, I'm not saying dig around out there. And again, I think the village was more down it was sort of protected by the hill, just on the other side. You know where the um, school is? We think the village was sort of right there, and it was sort of a natural crossing to go across the river. I walked that whole thing, and the, the Gabrielenos and the Lucenos, they got in a fight over whose village it was. But we couldn't find anything to prove which one was right, because the Gabrielenos technically are on the north side of the Santa Ana River. The Lucenos are on the south side. That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> More than I needed to know. You got to, go ahead, Craig. Ted? Uh, Greg, uh, whoever. That's fine. Uh, I just have, uh, th because this is a similar project, but it's going to run along Bluff, you just make sure our traffic mitigation is, there are a lot of people who use Bluff, correct? Correct, but this project should be entirely on site. Only, okay. only traffic should be of any type of trucks delivering onto the site, but everything should be enclosed operationally on the site. Uh, but there certainly will be um, the, the racks coming out that will be on there for uh, getting dirt and dust off. They'll certainly be going around and, and watering dust control quite a bit. But we don't 
have any planned any construction within the street that would require any type of traffic control at this time. And then this uh, this allowed because that's that federal land part of that grant we got we're okay we don't have any special. No, we're allowed to do all the construction on that because that and it's for this purpose, okay. which is for public um, benefit and public health. Okay. And as far as the. Uh, the archaeological uh, if you dig and you dig too the only thing I think you're going to find is the old spark plug factories remnants that may be around over there so I mean a bunch of ceramic stuff because that used to be a huge uh, spark plug factory on that near that property it was actually in the back part of Dilopes and and the old uh, dairy back up uh, Doc Saunders' place along that area who knows what they dumped in there so if you find some old ceramic spark plugs give them to Kevin okay his historical value. <laughs> and Ted, what happens when they find those spark plugs? They have to take it back to their lab to make sure that those plugs were not used by an Indian tribe. Okay. So my, my, my question is just how many days of grading do you anticipate on he this project? I did ask the contractor. He's anticipating about 26 days. Times two. Uh, consultants sitting out there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you a story later. <laughs> Robin, did you have anything? Okay, ma'am, do we have any uh, cards? We have no speaker cards on this item. All right. No. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second, please vote. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, item seven is an appeal hearing. It's the order of appeal hearing a staff presentation, council questions of staff, open the public hearing, that way the public speakers can speak in favor, against, or neutral, close the public hearing, council discussion, and action. And planning director, this is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. This is a project uh, that is proposing a private park entertainment facility on 26 acres. Uh, it's located at the western terminus of North Drive, which is a private street west of California Avenue. Uh, and the, the Planning Commission reviewed the project on December 11th, and they voted 3-2 to deny the project. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to skip forward to the description of the project because what we gave you in your staff report is is exactly what we gave to the Planning Commission um, to which it uh, the Planning Commission uh, deliberated and came to the conclusion that they did so basically what's being proposed is the legalization of existing structures for the private park equestrian and entertainment facility the use is permitted in the AE zone where the property is located upon approval of a conditional use permit. And then related to that uh, are ancillary uses that can be approved as well that include restaurants and other related facilities only when associated with and incidental to all of the uses that are permitted under the entertainment um, and recreation category. The, the, there are 30 buildings on the property. Uh, they've, they've all been constructed. Some have been constructed without permits. Some didn't need permits. There's a table in your staff report that summarizes all of this. There's actually eight buildings that have been constructed that were, should have been required to get building permits for. Uh, a lot of the buildings are, because of their size, do not are not required to get building permits for those. But the what's being proposed is a 
The event facility that would consist of these 30 buildings it does not include the private residence which is on the property. So all of these buildings that you're looking at tonight are, they're not accessory buildings to the residence. These are actual uh, necessary pertinent buildings to the conditional use permit that's being requested, which is for the event center. Uh, the properties, uh, all the construction has been on the southeast corner of the property, up next to the terminus of North Drive. The property itself actually goes under the river to the north side of the river, but all of the construction has occurred on the south side of the river, um, down towards North Drive. The, the applicant did provide all of the needed re uh, materials that are asked for on the, stat on the application so that the planning commission can make its deliberation. Uh, likewise, site plan requirements were all provided so that the, the planning commission could look at the project. The, there are findings that are needed for to be able to adopt a conditional use permit, and in this case there are two being requested. One is for the overall use itself, and the other one is for a proposed caretaker dwelling for the property. Um, the findings for conditional use permits um, are at the discretion of the decision-making body. Uh, the, the required findings that need to be made are that the proposed use will not impact the general plan or the public convenience or general welfare of persons residing or working in the neighborhood. The second one is the requested use will not adversely affect the adjoining land uses and the growth and development of the area. The third one is the size and shape of the site proposed for the use is adequate to allow full development of the proposed use. And then the fourth, that the traffic generated by the proposed use will not impose an undue burden upon the streets and highways in the area. Um, the, an initial study was prepared for the project itself. Uh, and the conclusion was that a negative declaration be adopted. The, so that's a, a basis of what the project is. And I'm going to jump forward back to the front of the staff report where there's a summary of the discussion and issues that occurred with the Planning Commission before they, before they took action on the project. One, um, there were seven issues, emergency vehicle access, vehicle impact and road maintenance on the private street, noise and operational hours, traffic, uh, number of restrooms, uh, potential continual use restaurant, and construction without permits. So the big one that probably garnered the most discussion was emergency vehicle access. Now the project was reviewed at Project Review Board and both the fire department and the sheriff's department were in attendance at that meeting and provided comments. Uh, at that point there were no issues brought up with regards to there not being emergency access to the property. Um, what we did after the Planning Commission meeting is we met with representatives from the fire department because the issue really is the fire engines and the potential or lack of potential for those to get back to the property. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> the conclusion stayed the same with the fire department that the project site does have emergency access available to it even during events uh, and and there are uh, I'll turn it over to the fire department if they want to add to that or if there are any questions directly to the fire department <coughs> sorry another issue that was brought up um, for discussion with the Planning Commission was the uh, potential impact to the road itself. It's a private street, it's a um, dirt road, and one of the issues that the Planning Commission discussed was the <coughs> difficulty, sorry, <coughs> I cannot get rid of this. <coughs> 
one of the issues that the Planning Commission brought up was the problem that private roads in the city have when it comes to dealing with multiple owners and getting everybody to agree to the cost and contribution of that road maintenance. Um, the project right now, because it's a private street, there are no conditions of approval for the project for the improvement of North Drive. Any improvement to that street would require uh, approval and agreement between all of the properties that have access to that street. So there are no conditions for street improvements on the project. Another issue that was brought up uh, was the noise and operational hours. The project currently is conditioned, or was conditioned, uh, that all activity, or all events conclude by 10 p.m. And one of the issues that was brought up for discussion with the Planning Commission was that there was no limit on how early in the day an event could start. Uh, a condition was never added because they, they voted to deny the project. But one of the issues that came up with that uh, it was that if, if the starting time was delayed to too late in the morning, it would preclude, potentially preclude, equestrian events at the site. But again, no condition was discussed to address that specifically. Uh, the other issue uh, that came up was traffic. Again, the, from our discussions at Project Review Board and the, uh, the initial study analysis that was done for the project, it was determined that, that the traffic impact would be not significant for on the street or to the neighborhood. Another issue brought up was the number of restrooms. <coughs> the, um, a statement was made that the, the, the site potentially does not have enough restrooms on it. Uh, one of the, if the project is ultimately approved by the city council, one of the requirements is that they have to pull building permits for all of the buildings. And in that review, if it's determined that there are not enough restrooms, then they'll be required to add restrooms. But that was not an issue that was brought up by uh, the Building and Safety Division in during project review. So as it currently stands, there's not a condition for more restrooms, but they still have to comply with, with state code in, in the number of restrooms provided based upon the occupancy and the number of people using it. Another concern that was brought up was a potential continual use restaurant at the project site. Uh, the applicants uh, who are here tonight, and they can speak to this issue as well, they're, they're not proposing that there be food prepared on site. It would all be prepared off site and brought onto the site for the events. Nonetheless, the, with approval of the conditional use permit, it does allow ancillary uses such as a restaurant that can operate ancillary to the events on the property. And the concern was that if this proves to be enormously successful in almost a daily activity, you, almost, you could end up having a restaurant that's open most of the time. And it wouldn't be limited to just event people. Somebody, anyone could drive in and, and go to this. The concern was that anyone could drive in and go to this restaurant. So that, that was a, an issue that was brought up. Uh, construction well permits, the, there was concern, uh, angst, if you want to call it, about the buildings that were built without permits. The, as is typical with any project where there's construction without permits, once they come in to apply for the permits, they do have to pay double application fees, and they have to also do whatever work's needed so that inspections of the construction can occur so that those permits can be um, ultimately approved or, or signed off. Uh, just an update, just to be clear, uh, there was a mistake in the Planning Commission staff report uh, indicated, or in, in the notice, that there was access to the property from Philly Lane. Uh, there is not access from Philly Lane, and they're not proposing that there be access from Philly Lane. It was a staff mistake. We apologize. 
And then with that, now, now that the project has been appealed, or the action of the Planning Commission has been appealed, the options that are available to the City Council are to uphold the Planning Commission action, which is denial of the project, and that only requires a roll call vote. Another action that the City Council can take is to overturn the action of the Planning Commission and approve the project and adopt the resolution that's attached to your staff report, which is the same conditions that were presented to the Planning Commission. Or you can overturn the action of the Planning Commission, approve the project, and alter or change or add conditions as you see needed. Um, one thing I do want to add, I, I did meet with a council member, I don't know which one, or I spoke to you on the phone, and I indicated that the project is conditioned that all the parking uh, for events be on the site. It does not have that condition, um, but it does have adequate parking on site. Um, but it doesn't have a condition that says all the participants have to park on the property. So whoever I spoke with, I apologize. That's not in there. And with that, the applicant is in the audience. And uh, there were a packet of uh, opposition letters that were presented to the Planning Commission, which were attached to your staff report. And there were additional opposition letters and support letters that came in today that you've received copies at the dais. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Uh, does council want to hear from the applicants before you ask any questions or comments or what's your choice? Okay, we'll do the questions up here first and we'll get the applicants to speak. Well, you hurt my feelings, Steve, because you and I had a conversation on Monday about this, so I'm certainly glad you were impressed. <laughs> uh, it, it, I'll, I'll try to run down most, most of these, but I'm going to come back to a few for discussion. Uh, but um, you, you did mention Philly Lane. <clears throat> that was in error. And, and I just want to just have that reiterated that um, at no time is Philly Lane being a private street is under any consideration Correct. now or in the immediate or foreseen future. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this conditional use permit, does it run with the land or does it remain just with the applicant? The way it's currently conditioned, uh, well, CUPs run with the land generally right. and there's no condition currently that the project only run with the owner. So it right now, if it was approved, it would run with the land. Okay. Um, I think what we're going to try to get to is that we have these seven categories that we need to address to, to give proper direction. Um, would you mind going through some of the conditions with me at this time as questions? Sure. Okay. Um, <coughs> some are just for clarification, but it, it's also a direction that I'm going to see where we'll be heading on. Um, but I'm going to keep this, uh, I'll try to stay in order. Um, actually, number nine, and this, this might be directed to you, John. Uh, condition number nine, no occupancy of any building and or structure shall be permitted, which is not in compliance with the approved plans and accepting upon specific review and approval. M my question to that is, is th from this, this point that there cannot be any uh, um, activities taking place in the, the near future until all these, appro if approved, all these approvals and conditions are completed. Yes. So if if there's something scheduled next month, it's not allowed to happen unless everything is completed. Yes, that that's the way it is now. I mean, if you obviously the council has the ability, if you decided to approve it, and there were issues brought to you that you you could uh, modify that, but but normally that's 
uh, what happens. So there are buildings built without permits. They need to be permitted and occupancies issued before they can be used. Okay. Uh, on 13, Steve, you, you talk about uh, the property owner being responsible for on-site landscaping and off-site landscaping with the public right-of-way. Um, I'm just thinking that public right-of-way should be scratched on that. I mean, there is no off-site landscaping, is there? Correct. Or any required? And actually, you could just scratch the whole condition because the one thing I left out in the, in the AE zone, it's a residential zone, so it doesn't have minimum landscaping requirements like right. a commercial zone does. So you could actually just take that out. So you could delete and 13? No public right away. No. Is that a yes or a no? Well, you know what, let's keep it in. We'll just take out the right away because okay. we do want them to maintain the property. Okay. So. All right. Um, 30, 33 was on uh, food services. So in, in your staff report, you talked about at this time no restaurant proposed, and they would just be bringing in food uh, and serving during those events. But you, your note is grease interceptors shall be required for all food service uses. So is that, even if you bring in food, you will still be required to put in a grease interceptor? Yeah, and the reason for that is, uh, one, uh, if there er ever is an event where they do cook on site, the grease interceptor's gotta be there. But even more importantly, uh, when food's brought in, you've got dishes to clean and that sort of thing, so it still needs to be there. Okay. And the, the size of that grease interceptor will be determined by which department? It's usually a health, isn't it? Health department? Uh, well, no, we usually uh, depend on the, the size of the project. Usually we go with the minimum 750 gallon grease interceptor okay. that usually handles almost okay. any business. And right. Rarely do we have to go beyond that unless it's a pretty substantial food service business. Okay. But it, when we're in doubt, we uh, will contact Seven. and talk with the health department too. Okay. So that let me to my next question related to that is, is those buildings okay are they connected to sewer city sewer or is my understanding is they currently connected to a um, septic system that was built um, uh, inappropriately um, that's part of the buildings to help help service them okay uh, but part of the condition is is they would have to connect his public sewer and they would uh, demolish the existing uh, septic system for those buildings because there is um, an already uh, uh, so that's what's going they're going to remove that as part of their conditions and that'll be your department on on the sewer Correct. and their sewer available where on north or down the private street down the private street okay so everything's going to connect to sewer correct Right. Um, 59, and this will also go to condition 62, is Steve, you talk about, excuse me, um, Title 24 energy calcs for um, basically heating and air for conditioning. <laughs> More so in condition 62 for the proposed conditioning of the multi-purpose event building. It should not this also include all Title 24 for electrical compliance? Yeah. All, all 24, uh, Title 24 standards. Yeah, every building that needs, needs a permit will be required so we can alter those two conditions and everything that needs a permit has to be Title 24. Okay. So. All right. So not not just mechanical but right. all electrical and whatever else yep. um, I wrap this up real quick so on the site plan um, in, in what we show in the AE zone um, is the recreational potential um, and in the application it's the equestrian element. Where, where is the area? There's no arena shown. There's no 
where's the the recreational animal keeping or tennis courts or golf course shown on this site plan uh, they don't have one right now uh, the and the applicant can probably speak better to what they intend to do with the property uh, but those are not on the site plan okay but but we base the application on that's the premise correct the potential for equestrian and uh, entertainment facilities yes couldn't have put that on the plan uh, the yeah I'll let the applicant address okay. that just as a clarification um, or just for information Steve the on the site plan number 16 is the main house but when I went to the site and it's a beautiful facility the big house is a guest house yeah what what happens the and I can't explain the history of, of uh, what happened when but the original house was at, at up by Philly Lane no access but it was up by Philly Lane the um, Oh, here it is so the applicant not this applicant a former owner came in and got approval to build a guest house which is now the main house on the property um, and the uh, where I was going with the answer here but okay. but the, the main house was originally approved as a guest house uh, but it's transformed into, into the main house on the property and the original house that was the main house when the guest house was approved is now becoming or proposed to become a caretaker dwelling okay last question before his pager goes off and dashes out of here chief do you want me to address that to you or to your capable uh right-hand person <laughs> with us tonight is Sandy Hastings from the office of the fire marshal she's our fire safety specialist for the city and she'll be answering those questions thank you <laughs> <laughs> this is the reason you're here Sandy <laughs> so uh, al along with the sheriff uh, Fire, you guys went down the road, drove down it, yes, and and that you found that adequate, yes. And one of the thoughts I had was, and it was based on a, a couple of comments and, and letters, and and I can't say for sure if that's one resident or two residents, whoever shares the private road, <laughs> that um, basically when there's activity taking place but I can't get into my driveway or I can't get out of my driveway so when you went down there it was wide open I, I would think that in a, when you're going to be called to be there it's going to be when there's a lot of activity and a lot of traffic D do you feel in, any impact with if there's more cars and activity on that road I mean should we have a condition that says no parking on the street something to that effect I don't think it would be a bad idea because there are there are areas of the um, the road the road is not a, a, a consistent width because of some trees and other you know obstructions so there are points where it reduces down to I believe 16 feet because of a tree stump and then it widens in other areas so there are pinch points on that road and if someone were to park for example where that tree stump is then they would reduce the width of that road dramatically and it would possibly make it where we couldn't get an engine down there in the event of an emergency for the most part if nobody's parking on that street of course it's completely clear and smooth and the road at this point is in good condition um, chief lane and I both drove it and it is in good condition and then once you get to the property it's concrete so mm -hmm. no issues getting on to the actual property itself um, I don't think it would be a bad idea to condition it that parking that the guests from that location 
location not be permitted to park on that street to lessen the impact of the neighbors and to reduce the likelihood that we would not be able to get onto the property during an event. Okay. And then, last part, I hope. I'd really like to ask this to Scott, but weight capacity on a residential road or that gravel road required by fire is what? <laughs> is it and is it adequate for that? Then you'll answer the adequate part, but it's it's a range seventy five thousand. It's forty thousand on that road, and it would be seventy five thousand in a larger commercial property. And you feel that's adequate? I, I I feel that's adequate. We do require that and use that on um, roads in Norco throughout Norco. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Bob, you got anything? I got one question. I don't know. Maybe this is yours, Sandy. Maybe you counted them. I didn't. On uh, north, when you come off there to go to that uh, property, how many houses, how many residences on North Street there? I believe four. Four, four on the north end of North Right, yes. that, that's the total total amount of residents that, that lives there. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mayor, I have a couple okay, Ted. questions. Um, and that alludes to Steve on 17 uh, on the items. Uh, open gravel identified as uh, the 93 parking spaces for customer and employee parking. Uh, those gravel parts, even though it says 93, they're not marked out at all. That's just assuming that's what you can park there, correct? Correct. But there is no specific uh, marked plan or marked parking. Okay. Nope. Yeah. Uh, on number 18, you have the accessible parking uh, provided based upon the occupancy of multi-purpose event building. Uh, having been there in, in the uh, ADA accessibility in that, and you can chatter your, uh, or you can say it's normally don't we pave? The, right now, there's no gravel. Uh, I mean, it's all gravel. I didn't when I was up there. I didn't recall seeing a a paved part for uh, ADA parking. So are we are they in compliance with that? I mean, the wheelchair access there. Uh, granted, I mean, you know, I have to use one. Is that it is difficult up there if you don't get up close to that building. So is that a condition to improve that to uh, bring it up to the new standards yes. for ADA? So paved, paved parking and how many would they be required to have there? Uh, I don't have the table in front of me, but based upon the the number, I think they're only going to be required to provide one. Okay, because normally it's one per hundred, and you've got two hundred, so it's I would at least think two. But that's if you can go check the code on that when we get yep. through that. Uh, and then uh, Councilman Newton, we've uh, alluded to it on the on uh, I believe fifty nine, the ADA access and and accessibility in the restrooms would be also the same thing. Yep. So they all be ADA compliant. <coughs> The other thing that I'm going to ask you is, there, do you know if there's a property or homeowners association that maintains that street? You know, normally the private streets, all the property owners have some kind of uh, agreement or something to do that. Is there one in that place on north at all? Not that I know of. So it's just when somebody decides that they're going to pay for the, uh, the upgrade on the gravel road or... Just like we do, I believe e, uh, East Street. You know, they have this slurry. They all the, the residents. There's nothing like that at all. Not that I know of. Um, the, the the homeowners could probably let me know if they did have that. <laughs> yes, they would. But okay, I'm not owner. aware of an association. Okay. There's only four. So. All right. uh, that's all the questions. I have. Thank you. Okay, if that's all the. Uh, Questions and get the applicant to come up and uh, speak, please. Oh, I guess according to the attorney here, I need to open the public hearing. It's open now. Okay, I am Tim Shamber. Uh, me and my wife are the 
applicants. We own the property. We're longtime Norco residents. Uh, I think I moved here in 1976, attended junior high and went to high school, met my wife there, uh, got married, raised our kids, raised our family. Our kids went to uh, Norco High and um, we're both graduates. So I want to just establish that I'm not just somebody who just moved in and trying to do something crazy. We bought the property, loved the property. My wife likes animals, horses. Uh, we did that right away. People came to us and wanted to uh, have their kids get married there. And I'm not going to say that I didn't see that when I first saw the property because right away uh, other friends who we asked their, their opinions, they said, God, you could do weddings here. You could do weddings here. And I'm like, okay. And that's what we set out to do. We kind of had some people approach us to do weddings. So we did two or three weddings. I did my daughter's uh, prom there, and we didn't have a barn. And what was happening is the police were showing up at 9 o'clock, 9.30, and saying that they could hear our music. And I want to assure you that I'm not out to make a big old party, you know, really loud. And I just want to have enough, have it loud enough so they could have a dance and have a good time. Uh, I went out and talked to the police officers and they said, you know, it's not really loud, but our, res our code says that if I can hear it within 100 feet, then I have to tell you to turn off the music or whatever. And uh, So I, ha I had two or three events. I had a birthday party for myself. I had a Halloween party. And about the third or fourth time the police came out, he said, you know, we're going to have to do something about this. So then I decided, okay, I'll build a barn. I'll build a barn to try to keep the noise down. And the policeman actually disclosed to me who was calling. And I tried to talk to that uh resident and he wasn't hearing anything so I decided I would build a barn so I went to the city I uh, hired an architect and an engineer they drew me up plans I went to the city and they said you can't build something that big I wanted to build a 3,500 square foot building I have 26 acres 14 of it of, of which is mitigated land I have tw uh, another it was actually 12, eight, 12 to 13 acres is mitigated land, so I have 13 acres where I could build a barn and do what I wanted to do. Uh, as it turned out, they told me I couldn't do that, so I, I got plans again. I, I uh, shrunk it down, brought it in. She said, no, it's still, you have to be a thousand square feet or smaller. And I said, I can't build something that small because it won't house what I want to do. I want to do weddings. I want to put the music inside so it's not loud. I've got barn doors so I could close it in so it's not that loud. She said, you still can't do it. Well, now that I've gone through the whole process and I did go ahead and built it anyways, uh, I should have been given the permits. I should have been given the permits for my uh, property because I was in an AE zone, which, uh, which I should have been able to get. Now, I built a 2,000 square foot building. I've been told by the city officials I could have built a 10,000 square foot. I, I was within my rights to do it, and the city should have approved it. I could have, but that didn't happen. But I had to do something because I didn't want the police to keep coming to my property. So that's why I built the building. The other build, there's another building. It was a, what we call the bride room now in the bathrooms. That building was already existing when I bought the property. The previous owner was doing weddings, and he had put in the, built, the, the bathrooms along with that building. But I went to improve that building, and it was before I even built the barn. I went to improve the building because it was really dilapidated, and uh, the bathrooms were in bad shape. I tried to just improve it, and after a couple days of trying to improve it, I just kind of got mad at it, and then I tore it down. And then I built a new one. And then a year and a half later is when I built the barn, is when I went to the city. So now all I want to do, and all I'm trying to do, is I want to be able to have 15 weddings a year, 12 to 18, somewhere in that neighborhood, because it is still my house. I don't want to, I don't want to be having a wedding every single weekend. I want to have my peace and quiet, but it's a big piece of property. It requires a lot of funding. Every time I turn around, there's 5,000 here. I got wells, I got hill, I got all kinds of stuff that I'm always paying for. So I wanted to find a way to uh, make some money. Uh, I don't ever want to open a restaurant. We never intend to open a restaurant. You could even put that in your CUP thing that says you can never open a restaurant, build a restaurant, because I never want to. Um, the other thing is, uh, you talked about, I just heard you fellas talking about um, 
putting pavement in. I have no desire to put in pavement. And Danny Azevedo at the Planning Commission pointed out at that meeting that DG is okay for the ADA requirements, that you could put in DG. And that's what I want to put in. Also, the last meeting that I came to, I really didn't bring anybody to support me, do anything for me. I just came by myself, me and my wife, and we didn't have no opposition as to, to the people who brought opposition to us. I know the number one reason is everybody on Philly Lane showed up because they thought that was going to open up. That's not going to open up, but now that they're here, they could say whatever complaints they want. Um, I did bring a little bit of support. Uh, I also want to point out that I don't just do my weddings. I do a lot of community events. We've done uh, Spark of Love Toy Drive in 2017, 2018. This year we decided not to do Spark of Love, but we did a muscular dystrophy uh, a drive. We have a family in Norco who has two children that are in wheelchairs and they want to join a soccer, like a basketball soccer thing and they need special wheelchairs so they put on a fundraiser for not only their kids but for more kids on the team to raise money so they'll have uh, wheelchairs to play in those games we do uh, a lot of Boy Scout activities and a lot of these things we don't charge for I don't charge the Boy Scouts they they have what's called a jump over the bridge thing we have a big koi pond with a bridge and when you become a Cub Scout to a Boy Scout it's called bridging the gap or something like that. So we've we've had four or five of those. We've had multiple uh, children in Norco who got uh, they achieved the Eagle Scout to become an Eagle Scout and we've told the leaders that every time somebody achieves Eagle Scout they could use our facility and they could have a banquet for their Eagle Scout and we've had many of those. We've also used our facility for many of the Norco High School athletic events or our athletic teams for their banquets. Uh, I remember when I was in school we used to go, we, st we started out doing restaurants, but my junior and senior year, we started having them inside the cafeteria, and it's really not cool to have be in the cafeteria. So I feel like I could lend my place uh, to the athletic people, and we've had a lot of people have them. We've had the baseball team, we've had the rugby team, we've had the cheerleaders. Cheerleaders come out every year and do all their pictures on our facility. They've had their banquets there. We've had a... Uh, uh, football has had a bingo thing to raise money f uh, for the Gridiron Club. Um, I, I can't say I should have wrote down all the things that we do because we do a lot of community events for a lot of people, and we don't charge everybody for everything. And, and like I said, I just want to do. I want to be able to have 12 to 15 events. Uh, I'm willing to meet whatever CUPs. You know, they make me meet, and I've gone over most of them with uh, Steve, and I've agreed to do those. And uh, I've asked a few people to come and speak again on my behalf, but there's only there's one thing on the CUP that I don't like, and it's saying that I have to get a, a precise grading plan. Uh, and I, and I don't really want to do that because I don't feel like I should have had to do that because number one, my buildings were built in different years and it says that they, and so I brought my architect, he has more about the rules and all that stuff. So he drew something up and he wrote up the rules and he, I'm gonna have him talk about how that works and how he thinks it should work. But I don't believe I should, I'm, I'm worried about if you, uh, make me do this precise grading plan that they're going to come up with more stuff like a storm drain and how you're going to get rid of the water and all that kind of stuff. So I'm worried about the cost of that. And just to get a uh, civil engineer involved, you're talking twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. I never did any grading. All I did was dig the footings for my building and put it up. I've since asked the city, why do I have to have that? And they said, well, it's got if it's five thousand square feet or bigger, you got to have that. Well, my building is not five thousand square feet. Well, then they said, well, you're going to combine the two, combine the bathrooms and the bride room type thing. That's what we call it, it's the bride room bathrooms with the event building. Now it's over 5,000 square feet. Well, if, if that was the case, why do I only have to put sprink fire sprinklers in the multi-purpose building? They're not, they're not putting those two buildings together there. They're not saying now we're going to put them both together, you've got to put it in that building too, because the other building's under 1,000 square feet.
So I feel like I shouldn't have to do that. That's really the only CUP that I don't want to follow. I'm, and I've been told that the city council could help me with that. And I, like I said, I did bring my architect. Um, I also brought some people from my main road. I had, I had another gentleman who wasn't able to come, but he sent me a text. He wanted me to read you a big text. Instead, I gave it to Sonia. Sonia owns the riding stable uh, on the, right on the corner there on my street. She has a, a riding stable there, and she's very good friends with Gary as well as I am, and Gary is my next door neighbor. He's the neighbor closest to me on that street. He said he would come, but he's working, and he's working nights, and he said he couldn't get off work to do it, and I didn't want him to take a day off work just to come and speak. So, uh, I've had, I got four or five people who sign cards and they're going to come up and speak on my behalf. So I, I hope that you could see it in, you know, your heart to vote it through because we've had a lot of, you know, weddings, uh, class reunions, a, a lot of stuff. And I really pr primarily just want to cater to the Norco people. And I think it's a good thing for Norco. It not only helps me make money, but it also brings revenue to the city. Because I, I know one wedding we had the, uh, the groom's whole family was from Wisconsin. And they had 30 or 40 people all flew out for the wedding. They all stayed in motels and hotels, whatever we had. And they ate at our restaurants. And they were here for almost a week. And they're not the only ones. We've had people come from out of the country, you know, for our events. So it brings revenue to the city, not as well, not just me. And like, and again, I want to go back to the restaurant. I'm never going to open a restaurant. I don't want to be in a food business. The only food that's ever going to be served at my place is going to be what's catered in. Uh, I, I mean, we might do hamburgers and hot dogs for like a, we have a. Uh, Easter Easter uh, Easter egg hunt. We've done that for four or five years now. It, it's gotten up to like 70, 80 kids. Well, with all those kids, you got all the grandmas and parents and everything. And that's the only thing that I think I've ever cooked. And we just barbecue. We barbecue outside on, and we make hamburgers and hot dogs. That's all it's ever going to be. I'm never going to be cooking. I'm never going to open a B&B. I'm not. I just I just want to have be able to uh, do weddings. So I guess I'm done. Any any questions? Anyone have any questions for him? Can I just reserve the right to ask questions of the applicant after the other speaker cards? Fine. Thank you. Fine. Okay. Yes, so sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, do we have any cards? Yes, the first speaker is Alan Day. I'll re remind everybody on the speakers, we have uh, three minutes and I will hold you to it. So, Chad, you got the clock. Okay. Mark. Ready to go? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I, uh, my name is Alan Day. I've been a resident of uh, Norco for almost 40 years. Um, we're retired from Irvine Police Department. When I worked for the police department, I was involved in the operations for numerous special events, including the Irvine Meadows Amphitheater. So I'm well uh, familiar with the uh, large event operation. Um, I've also had the pleasure of raising both of my sons in town. They both uh, played Jaff football, attended Norco schools. Um, all the time that I've lived here, uh, as a matter of fact, both of my kids attended Town and Country Day School. Um, all the times that I've lived here, the time that I've lived here, I felt it was, it was important to support local businesses. Um, I remember the first time I went into Norco Hardware to write a check, and I didn't even have a local address yet. But they said, oh, you live in Norco? Fine. No ID necessary. And I knew this was the town for me. Um, I, uh, I, I, somebody mentioned Trina's Restaurant. That brought back uh, memories from long ago. Um, I, uh, I've known, I've had the pleasure of knowing the Shambers for many years, know their family. Um, when they started holding events at their property, um, I think we might have been one of the very first ones. Uh, my son uh, went to school with their kids and uh, he and his wife uh, wanted to get married there. And at that time they didn't have a building, they actually had to bring in a, uh, a large tent because it rained that day. 
A um, couple of years later, my wife, who was uh, sick with breast cancer, uh, knew that the end was approaching, and she approached Tammy Shamber, and she said, I want to plan my memorial. And she said that's where she wanted to have it, and she did. Um, wonderful event. Um, my, my other son at that time was planning on getting married at a uh, winery down in Temecula. He saw the facility that they had and he and his, his uh, current wife, they walked away from their deposit at the winery so that they could have their wedding uh, at the Chambers event uh, facility. Um, I've seen the way they operate it and they operate a quality, quality program. Uh, they have their people standing at the gate checking people that are coming in to make sure that they're on an invitation list. Uh, this isn't something where somebody's going to crash the party and create problems because they have their people watching. Um, they have, uh, the parking is located on the side of the property away from the adjacent houses. Uh, it, it, uh, it just worked out that way and it works out very well. Um, when they do have drinking there, when they're serving alcohol, it's the they're folks that are serving the alcohol. It's not some bartender that got hired for the day. They're watching the people. They're making sure the people are behaving themselves. Um, in short, I feel this is the type of kind of a small family-run business that we in Norco should support and should have more of. Um, Tim made a really good point. It's his house. He's not going to have a restaurant operating on his property at his house. He wants to be able to live there and live a peaceful life. He's just trying to operate a small business, and I think we should support it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Sonia Trefethen. Guys, thank you for your time. Um, I am one of uh, their immediate neighbors on that road of North Drive. Uh, the tree stumps belong to me and I will definitely get them out of the way. I wouldn't want to do anything to interfere with emergency vehicles getting through there. Um, so that's a really simple thing for us to get fixed. Um, we've been observing the, the activities that they have down there and it we've not had any problems on the road from my perspective of it. Um, the traffic flows really easily down there. It's well managed at the gate and it flows in. I've never seen it backing up or having any problems with parking or, or anything of those issues. Um, as well as noise, it's just not been an issue. I, it must be the barn, but I'm an immediate neighbor and haven't heard, had any noise issues, haven't had any repercussions from the people that are there. Um, the type of people that are coming through are very nice and respectful as they come in and out and there's just been no issues from my perspective. Um, Tim mentioned the letter that Gary sent and Gary's the last house as you go down North Drive, the very last house on the right hand side before their gates. Um, so I think if anybody was going to be in affected by it. Um, probably Gary would be the number one person. Um, the, na the letter that he said that he would like us to read for you is, Dear Norco City Council, my name is Gary Dix and I would like to inform you that my neighbor Tim Shamber is a great neighbor. He takes pride in his property. I enjoy having weddings next door to me. They are classy and positive events. Um, and again, he lives at the, the 367 North Drive, which is just before his location. Um, I would love to see them continue running it. There's no doubt from a neighbor's perspective that they're willing to um, do whatever it takes to make sure that the roads are maintained and that neighbors are happy. They're very available to all of us and, and easy to talk to and just really, really good people running a simple business and doing a beautiful job of it. So we're happy to have them next to us. I agree that it's bringing a lot of business into town um, as my business business does. It comes all the way straight down 6th Street, all the way through through town to the end. Um, so I know the impact that that has on the local businesses. Um, and it's it's good business that they're bringing in. It, it's a nice group of people. So we're definitely in support. And um, that's myself and the immediate neighbors and our immediate neighbor to them, um, as well as the one across from me I've talked to recently. And everything seems to be on a good path. So if there's anything that we can do or answer to help make it go through, let us know. Thank you. Jared Vieira.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Jared Vera. I'm the senior pastor of the River Church uh, here in the city of Norco. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with the Shambers for, and, and partnering with them for several years. Um, they do not attend my church, at least not yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I've done several weddings there, memorial services, um, and uh, fundraising events. Uh, I helped participate, partnered with them for the, the Sparks of Love and uh, helped them gather the, the toys obviously for children in need and uh, which makes me think of like the emergency vehicle access stuff like we've actually had the fire engine on site for that event for kids to hang out and it's had to leave at different times uh, while the you know guests are there and so uh, as far as a, a capacity issue and being able to access I don't, I don't think it is at all an issue. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I know they don't want to grow it into some big, great thing, but I can tell you the level of service, the excellence, uh, just who they are, uh, that the farm has an opportunity to really be a flagship venue of its type uh, for the city of Norco. Uh, is incredible, incredible service there, uh, like none I've, I've experienced. And I've, I've, I've done, ven I don't want to say names, but I've done venues, I've done weddings at other venues here in town, and there's not nothing like uh, what the Shambers do here. Um, I believe the, the, the Shambers represent us well, the rural lifestyle, um, uh, commitment to community, family life. Uh, they have been extremely generous uh, to the community, like the Scouts and the Eagle Scouts, uh, to our local food bank. Um, they probably don't want me to say this, but they are uh, and have been our uh, largest single donor uh, to our storehouse food bank that serves hundreds of Norco residents on a monthly basis. And so um, I think uh, having uh, the Shambers here in the farm is an incredible asset and, uh, to our community. Uh, denying, uh, I think, the, the use would be, would be a disservice uh, to our city. And, uh, and so, uh, so, yeah, I want to encourage a yes vote on the, on the use of facility. And, uh, and even if you have it uh, within your power, <laughs> if you will, to uh, to allow them to uh, to continue to accommodate guests as they uh, fulfill these conditions, I, I would strongly encourage you to do that if you're able to. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, David Haig. Good evening, council members, mayor. Uh, I will be brief to the extent I can in a three-minute conversation with you. Uh, two issues occurred to me. I would identify myself as a resident on Philly Lane. I live at 350 Philly Lane, which puts me one house between me and the start of the property under discussion. Um, there are two issues to my mind that the council really needs to consider, one of which was significant to the Planning Commission and is almost an underlying theme here, and it's the access issues for those who live on North Street who wrote letters and complained about parking issues. It was suggested at the Planning Commission that an attempt be made to create some sort of a compact that would allow everybody to live in peace on North Street so that you don't have people parking your on your driveway, blocking your access, what have you. That does not appear to have been done. And I would suggest very strongly that an effort be made to do that before the council actually votes on this particular issue because I think that might alleviate a great deal of the concern that those of us who are opposed to this as a continuing operation, and let's be honest, none of us want to prohibit somebody from making good use of their property and being good neighbors. We're not here to fight about that kind of an issue. We're not here to fight about the, the humanity of the person who's presenting this particular proposal to you. We're trying to make the community work properly. And that includes working for us who live there. And none of the people live there right next to the, the property itself who do listen to the noise, who do deal with the dust, who do deal with the traffic. The second issue in this I think can be addressed. There is one thing that scares me to death, 
and that's the possibility of a restaurant there. I cannot think of a more unsuitable location for a restaurant. Uh, those of you who know Silver Lakes would give you the complete opposite of what I would call an event type restaurant where you have that massive entrance, you have, you know, Hamner Avenue, you have lights, you have everything you need to allow access anytime, day or night, whatever the restaurant wants. We are talking about not a gravel road, a dirt road, one lane, that if we're allowing a restaurant, and it's not even being requested, but as was pointed out, this runs with the land. And if you approve something which says, well, I'm never going to do it, and two years from now he sells, and somebody says, well, you know, I'm going to make some money on this. I can put in a restaurant. I can get people here at 6 in the morning, and we can run until 10 o'clock at night, and I can even ask for some sort of a modification. And that, I think, should be addressed in any sort of discussion of the issues. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, Clint Stone. My name's Clint Stone. I am a resident on Philly Lane. Um, like Dave said, I'm not opposed to somebody using their property and making money. I don't want to hinder anybody's livelihood. My concern, I can't add anything onto his. I have a two and a half year old, it'll be three soon. I have another baby coming, but Philly Lane's private. I bought that on that street because it is private. It's very quiet. I have no traffic really. Um, the fear I have is vehicles driving down my road while my kid's out there riding his little power wheel or his little bicycle. Um, it's been quiet as of late, but maybe that's because the events have actually stopped because of the processes that are in place. Um, when they were holding parties, we did have people that would go down the street, because they do live on Philly, they'll bypass the dirt road thinking that it's something else and they'll end up turning on my street and then turning around and coming out. So my only concern is, is the safety of that and how to redirect that traffic to make sure it goes down North Drive and not Philly. But then, like Dave said, if the homeowner decides to sell in the future, hopefully, you know, don't want to wish anybody any kind of ill will, but guarantee in life you're going to die at some point. So if, if something happens tragically to the homeowner or anything on the property, what will the next people do with that property and how will it impact my house if I'm still there or future residents? But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Suzanne Hay. Good evening, <coughs> council members. I uh, used to advocate for a livelihood, but I spend 15 years and I don't really have my sea legs, so I'm doing the best I can. Um, obviously, I'm connected with Mr. Haig. <coughs> I live on uh, Philly Lane, and <coughs> I appreciate the fact that the error with regard to our street was corrected. However, there are still issues which involve um, one, I have a, a concern about the emergency response in the sense that if um, clearly the road can accommodate a fire truck. However, if there is some kind of event that occurs, that requires an emergency response. Um, for example, <clears throat> not too long ago, a palm tree in that last house that's been referred to on, on um, North Drive somehow got on fire. My neighbor came home from work, saw the smoke coming up behind his barn, and um, called the fire department. Well, that was at a time when nothing was going on. I, the situation that concerns me is if that happened during a, an event with two, the maximum 200 people, um, people would see that, be scared, and be driving out of that property. The fire truck's going to have to um, <coughs> be able to go against traffic to get through there. So I think that there are issues that that could come up. Um, the other issues 
<coughs> our noise and traffic as Mr. Stone stated, once events started happening there, Philly streets, Philly Lane is a really quiet street. Uh, there are <coughs> five residences. Um, we've been there for 17 years. We, uh, the kids, kids who grew up there, that's where they learned to ride their bicycles. People, uh, it's a great place after a rain to train your horse to walk through water puddles. Um, <clears throat> my, some of my neighbors and neighbors down on California, when we were training our, taking obedience courses from Mr. Livell down <clears throat> on 8th Street, we would practice in the evening with our, with, um, or in the day with our dogs. So it's a street that can be used for local traffic without the fear of um, vehicles. And and as I, I really, I took exception with the finding requested that the impact of that on the local residents is insignificant was the word that was used. It's not insignificant. Okay. The, no the noise also... I'm going to um, stop you, ma'am. We've got a lot of speakers, and we go by the three minutes. You can give your rest of your report well, to the city clerk there. They, I was just going to say, the noise does impact our ability to y use our property. Thank you. And the last speaker card is Hossein Sand. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Hossein Zand. I'm a civil engineer. I'm part of the, the technical team from Mr. Shamber. The issue that he brought up regarding grading plan for the two buildings that they have built at the site, based on what I saw and I observed, they did not move more than 50 cubic yards, and that exempted from grading permit or grading plans. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to uh, council. Ted, you want to start up down here? Yeah, I'm still <clears throat> concerned about the uh, the ADA access, but I'm sure that if we're going to open, if it's going to be open, that they're going to make sure that it is done properly according to the standards. Uh, the other issue, and I, I hear this with the restaurant, and I understand what we're saying, and Steve, in our CUP process, we can place in there that no restaurant facility will ever be approved, correct? Even though it's zoned for that? Yeah, you, you can add a condition that basically limits what kind of food can be served at the project site. You can add a condition that says if they want to put in a, a full service kitchen that they have to come back to you for a uh, modification to the CUP. So yes, you can, however you want to condition it, you can do that. Okay, so that, and, and, and this is something the Planning Commission addressed too when they were doing it, is that there would be, no, okay, yep. thank you. Uh, no further, Mr. Mayor. Kevin. All right, so I want to make sure, <clears throat> you know, first off, I want to say I am, I'm really um, impressed with the civility and the, uh, I was very proud of all of you who live in Norco, the way you spoke. Um, I was really impressed and I really appreciate it. We don't always have people opposing one another that are clearly good people and civil, and I really appreciate that. Um, so a couple of things. I'm concerned about Philly, <coughs> but it sounds like there's some room here. So one, we have to make sure no restaurant goes there. Absolutely never, ever. Um, and just as a sort of exposure, I've actually been to several events at the property, and I've seen it's always been catered and that kind of thing. Um, one of the things I'd like to see is if you're willing to remove those stumps in a timely manner, that would be really, really good. I mean, let's say, let's put a time limit on three months, six months, something like that. All right, a week. Uh, but I'm concerned about Philly. And is there some way, Steve, <coughs> 
that we can um, it's catching what you have by the way so thank you um, no parking on the st first off all right so on um, the street going into it I, I personally would also like to see that there's absolutely no parking on that street by anybody I'm sure that's already there but just I want to firm all this stuff up um, Well, if it's a business, I think you can condition it as a business. And uh, when I was there, you have plenty of parking, uh, correct? So are you, I'm hearing that we can't condition a street to not have, it's a private street. Well, we can, and John will correct me if I'm wrong here, but we can condition, condition the project that the participants have to park on site. Problem is the enforcement because it's a private street. So I would throw that out to our city attorney and sheriff. Yeah, I don't have too much problem with the enforcement of that condition. Uh, I would think that the difficulty is that there's another group of people that isn't going to an event there that's visiting uh, somebody who lives on the street. Oh, no, I, uh, what I meant is that that we need to. I totally get that somebody who's visiting somebody on the street they can park there. I'm saying I would like to see some very strict controls by the you, property. You, you owner. can condition the CUP that all uh, event parking right, be that's held what I meant. on the site and, yeah. and specifically call out that there's no event parking on uh, north. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> how do we keep them off of Philly? Because I actually went down to Philly. Sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't admit that, but and I knew better, and I thought, well, okay, I'm going over to look at the place, and I went down the street, and I went, oh, I can't get through there, so I had to go around. I, I'm a Norco High graduate. I'm challenged. What can I tell you? Um, yeah. Is there some way that through signage, through something, that we can protect Philly so that people don't enter. Now, one of the problems we just have to face is people think they're going to Riverside and they buzz right by north and they go into the bluffs. We get that. And one of the things we've talked about is maybe bigger signage to let people know that there's no access or there's no, you know, we can't get out, don't go through here, turn right, and sign that goes to Riverside, something. Is there something we can do that's not obtrusive in a neighborhood that maybe can help them on Philly? Signs are only for the ones that do. <laughs> well, I'm a Norco I graduate, and I can read. <laughs> There's three Norco I graduates on the council, so you know I'm the I'm the challenged one. Un um, unfortunately, the answer to your question is a little more complicated because uh, Philly's a private street. Right, so I get it. The city doesn't have the ability to put signage on the private street. Yeah, but leading but into it though, that's a but, public uh, street. But if it's public street, we can put signage on the public street saying, you know, no access or this, no through traffic or. Or some, something to just as much as possible to warn people to try to protect that street because I totally get where they're coming from. Access to the farm or... Um, <laughs> uh oh, I... Uh, well, talk to Gavin Newsom. He's trying to erase all those things, so... Um, <clears throat> stumps, emergency response, fire... Uh, I personally think that it's an asset to the community. I I actually like it when somebody does something like this. Um, I probably won't get much of agreement, but I I actually do not have a problem with as they are bringing these things together as long as there's a time limit. I don't have a problem with them having some events, but the moment that they don't get something finished, then we say we're really sorry, but you didn't comply, or, or something like that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I also, because it's such a large, you know, one of the problems with Norco, and it's a great problem, is that some properties can have big buildings on them, and some properties can't. And the people, it's always the ones with the ones that really can't, the one have the big buildings. But in a situation like this, this is a very unique piece of property. Um, but that said. Uh, I would totally understand. The other thing is it appears to me that a lot of effort's been made to uh, mitigate the noise on the property. Um, I don't live there though, so I'm, I'm hesitant to, 
to really res to respond to that. By the way, one of the things you need is air conditioners in that building, just so you know, some big fans or something. Um, I'm trying to address everything the people from Philly talked about. So no restaurant, some way to keep people off their street. I think he's mitigated the noise. We do have noise ordinances within keeping people going to the events not on the street. Um, and I guess the only thing, con and I and I totally agree that. I think that any time that we put uh, the word insignificant in a report, we just shouldn't use those words. We should just say that the impacts, because we're talking people and everybody's different and to say I can totally relate to why you would think the impact, well, it's not insignificant and that immediately gets people's hackles up. So I think in the future we need to refrain from words like that, find something that's a little bit more just generic, do you know what I'm saying, Steve? Rather than the impacts are insignificant, and you got somebody on Philly who's just had 12 cars, including mine, drive down their street trying to find the place. Right. So, um, I, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your time. And again, I am so impressed with the people that's, that spoke today. Thank you so much. It really, um, the civility was deeply appreciated, so thank you. That's all I have to say. Okay, Robin. So I'm not sure if this is a Steve question or a John question, and John's not listening. Um, this, is there any way that we can have the CP go with the owner of the property versus being yes. carried with the yes. property? Yes. So how do we do that? That's a condition in the CUP. So it's a condition. So I would request that that is done <laughs> as well, that the CUP goes with the owner of the property, not with the land. Um, and then I'll be honest, the only opposition that I received personally as a council member is the noise. Um, and so I don't know if there's something else beyond the noise ordinance that is enforceable um, for us. I would, do you have, there's not really anything, right? Well, I mean, again, I don't know that there's any way of fashioning it, but if there was some way of uh, increasing the ability on the property to mitigate the noise, that you can do. I mean, you know, I'm not suggesting block walls or things like that, but, but for example, that's that's how noise is mitigated. Uh, a requirement maybe that all amplified uh, sound be contained within the uh, barn structure. Uh, maybe that's probably what it is anyway, but right. that's, I don't know that. Well, it's in condition 19, no sound amplification system provided with projects outside the confines of the multi-purpose building. Um, okay, and then the other question then, and I did highlight this on number 19, because I feel like some of these conditions were kind of boilerplate in their nature. Um, if you read in the middle of number 19, it says, in the event of approval of any um, such system, technical details of the systems like loudspeakers and paging are re um, subject to review and approval by the planning director or designee. So we're gonna be on page five at the bottom. Right. And like when I'm reading that, I'm thinking that's like a CarMax condition or a fast food restaurant condition. Um, versus kind of the application that we have going on here. So I don't know if it would be appropriate on that one to just leave the first part as is and then just say well, there will be nothing else although, or strike it out or... Although, again, I mean, it's, we're kind of imagining things. But, right. But if you had uh, a wedding outside that there was sound amplification mm -hmm. uh, or you know, music that was related to that wedding outside that required sound application, that should probably should be reviewed and approved by the staff. But, uh, but where would that be approved? Because if I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to have a portable speaker system and a microphone, and I'm going to put those two small speakers up the day of the event with a single yeah. microphone for the couple yeah, and, and the and pastor. But that doesn't require approval, correct? It does. 
Yeah. For every single event? Yes. Enforceable and checked by who? The, well, if they're going to do the way the condition is written, if they're going to propose any system outside of the confines of the building, they have to get approval from planning first. And what we're going to require is similar to what we do with several lakes, which obviously has much bigger events. But they have to demonstrate to us the equipment and what what the sound level is going to be produced, and then, if needed, what level of mitigation they're going to incorporate to reduce that down. And in addition, we do have, as a measuring standard, the noise ordinance. Okay. Um, did you mean the CUP travels with the owner or with the land? With the owner. So the next owner would have to reapply for everything or? Yeah. <clears throat> So that we we are clear on that, John, because that is not what we've been told in the past. Yeah. Uh, to apply this consistently going forward, is that a state law or simply something NACO can no, actually, determine? No, actually, 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 yeah, not getting too detailed. The conditional use permit, not as a matter of state law, but as a matter of case law, runs with the property because it's it's a use, uh, but it's not. I want to say atypical, but there are other situations in Norco <coughs> the, uh, does not, when the property changes hands, the CUP does not continue to uh, be effective. So here's my concern is that sell the property and the next person comes in, there's a different council sitting here and they say, gee, a restaurant sounds like a great idea. And I'm just wondering if, well, if maybe we should. Yeah, unfortunately, <coughs> I mean, if that happens, there's nothing you can do to solve that problem. Uh, all it takes is uh, an application to amend the CUP in three votes, no matter whether it runs with the land or whether it's the owner. Pesky democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing, Robin, too, is the sound thing. I'm wondering, because it's for a smaller operation, is there some way that they can, let's say they buy their own sound equipment, and they each time they don't have to, they could just come in and say, we're using the sound equipment that we've been using. And so to sort of streamline that just a little bit so it's not onerous. Yeah, we could we could definitely set up a, a a system where if for that kind of situation, if they're using the same equipment that's already been proven to be safe for neighbors to not produce noise levels that would uh, cause a violation with the sheriff's department, we'll just go ahead and let them keep using that. They don't have right. to. In addition, apparently that hasn't been an issue to date. Yeah. Well, thanks, Robin. I just wanted to clarify that. <coughs> Greg. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this may seem like it's going to bounce around a little bit, but uh, let's go to. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the applicants. Um, a couple of months ago, I had the pleasure of visiting your facility. It's beautiful. I, I think it's something that is needed in town. And uh, so I appreciate your time and your explanations. Um, so what I, I went back to that, and I think this is, uh, Suzanne kind of touched on it a little bit on the findings that any decision we make has to be based off of the four findings that are presented by staff. And it has been years since we have ever addressed anything in the AE, our, our agricultural uh, estate zoning, um, 18.12. And this is one of the, the problems I had with the Planning Commission on this at our, our last meeting. But um, in 1812-08, uh, one of the intents with this is that um, 
related to the restaurant and all these incidental uses, the Planning Commission shall ensure that the imposition of appropriate conditions that no interference with the conduct of nearby residentials, residential uses occurs. So to, to me that's kind of a primary driver that how we should address these seven uh, critical items. So in no particular order. On, uh, with the traffic on Philly Lane, um, this is just a suggestion as I also live on a private street and if you drive down it, and the first thing you see is a bunch of signs from six of the nastiest people you'll ever want to meet that basically says, no parking, go away, neighborhood watch. Um, we don't like you, we don't want you, okay? So, as a suggestion, I would... I thought I'd, I'd, take it down and just replace with your name. Yeah, there you go. As a suggestion, I would also look at some signage that way, you know, for your own private street. But then, Steve, for the facility, where are we with signage that would stop it at the entrance that Kevin should have turned into? How can we help with that well and the issue again is the private street the um, I mean we could <clears throat> we could add a condition that every time there's an event that they they put like a placard out at California North and says the farm access this way and points them into the but as, <clears throat> as far as a permanent sign they have to get permission from everybody that has rights to that street Really, they have signage saying farm, arrow, this way? Yep. Okay. Um, do me a favor, Steve. Make sure you write all these down, because that's going to be my last question, is, is for you to repeat all the conditions we've changed or added. So you would suggest that, and, and we can, at the end, ask the applicant if this is acceptable, is that with any event, Let's, let's put some temporary signage out there. <laughs> okay. Um, back on condition number nine, um, with the, that was an earlier question to John about uh, no events to take place um, until everything's completed. Uh, Kevin, you had brought that up. As a, as a remedy, what would you think about while this work and all this progress is taking place that if there are any uh, events scheduled that they just uh, go to Steve for a special event permit temporarily. Is that doable, Steve? Yes. Um, or, or is this hard and fast on nine? I can go either way on that. The problem we have is, for instance, if, if uh, and I'll let John jump in, but if they're going to do outdoor events and not use the buildings, I think that would, that would be fine. But I don't think the city should be put in a position of saying, yes, you can use these buildings, even though we don't know they're safe. Yeah. Well, then you get into the problem with the sound, right? Can't use the buildings, it's going to be outside, and then you're going to have sound out there. I mean, I'm, I'm a little more concerned about Steve's prior comment that uh, uh, essentially, we're allowing occupancy of buildings which have not been issued a C of O and have not been inspected. Okay. So I would hope that uh, the the first thing which would be done, and and it could be that the buildings uh, really don't take any man. They were built to our standards, and we could prove it. Then uh, getting a C of O should be pretty simple. Uh, if if they're not, then we have concerns that are legitimate anyway about people occupying them. So I would think that first on the priority list for the property owner would be coming in with his plans and getting an inspector out there and fixing the building. Okay. And and I'm fine with that. So number nine remains. I was just trying to but find a solution. Can I follow sure. up? Yeah. Can they have events there that are all outdoors? As long as they're not occupying the buildings, yes. Yeah. Okay. And there's no sound. Yes, well, there, or the sound is the sound. The sound I mean, that's what you have in your conditions. That all sa sound amplification has to be inside, and except for 
those which are approved. That's what we just talked about. Yeah. That, that system which is approved by. Right. Okay. There you go. Um, restaurant. Can we just, as we said before, can we just work with this and just in that zone, if you go back to that 18.12, why can't we just make some kind of motion or whatever in that section, say restaurants are not ancillary uses in a AE zone, at least it takes it out of this situation. So you're recommending adding a condition <clears throat> that no permanent kitchen facilities be constructed there without modification of the CUP? Or you don't need um, to put in the last part. <laughs> just, just, no just no. Okay. All right. And I'm going to take that based on the applicant's comments that is not interested in a restaurant. Well, and, and, and all food's going to be brought in, so... And remember what, what the conditional use permit is, is you're approving a use which is defined as whatever's happening on the property, subject conditions. And the use, since it doesn't involve a restaurant, one of the conditions can easily be that there can't be any permanent uh, food service uh, structures constructed. Okay, so go then go back with the CUP going with the land and the next owner that decides to come back for a restaurant. <coughs> well, where where I mean, do you stop that? Yeah. I mean, is it, yeah. well, that's are, what I'm are saying. Are you Why? proposing what? changing a, a zone change, right? Yeah. If no, well, want. it's not a zone change, but it's. But just I made a, a piece of the not a yeah. zone, but removing an ancillary use under 181208. Yeah, that way you solve the whole problem. But but you're in that AE that zone amend, only. You're going to have to do that by amending the code to specifically. Right. Okay. I'm not saying that that's not a necessarily a good idea. But, Fine. But in order to address this problem tonight, uh, that isn't going to happen. I mean, remember, it gets to go through the Planning Commission, public hearings, all those fun things. Can't just so, simply amend it. So, what we can, can do, though, is yeah, in this case only. Yeah. And it may be there are some circumstances, and I, I'm making it up, I don't have any idea, but maybe there's some. Uh, AE property that uh, in a restaurant is an appropriate use. You know what I love, John? <laughs> Those two people right there have been friends of mine for 30 years. They're both <laughs> attorneys, and you as an attorney say, you know, you just make some stuff up and move on. So, well, thanks for the advice. Um, you know, in, in that, I know. <laughs> in, in, Craig, if I can, yeah. I think John's got a point, and, and this comes back to the fact that this is an AE zone, and one of the uh, uses is the equestrian event center. Right. Which, if you thought about it, and they made it a private equestrian event center, and say it was a private club, they could actually, under this rule, be able to put a restaurant in there to serve their club members. Yeah. And that would be a legitimate yeah. approved use in that in this and, zone. And, and remember... That's what we have to be careful of if, for, sure. for prior right. owners. So. And, and everything comes back to you under any circumstances. Or no restaurant, no permanent food service facility is a matter of right. It comes back to a city council that says, well, no, the impact is too great on this property. You can't do it, just like you are tonight. Okay. So where we are right now is... A restaurant's not going to be allowed in this conditional use permit. Correct. Something for the future, as Kevin brought up, what's going to happen in five years, you know, or two years. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. well, no, that's right. Unfortunately, right. there's not much we can do about that. That if there's noth nothing to preclude, you know, day after tomorrow, an applicant coming in and asking for modifications to the CUP and goes through the same process again. Uh, <laughs> Maybe with a different outcome, but yeah, you know, that's what that's what government's about. Yep. Due process, right? Okay, so we've talked about North Street signage, parking on site. That'll be 
conditions, Steve, correct, all parking on site. Uh, Chief, there was um, a few comments made uh, just basically over a, with emergency response in different scenarios. Do you have any comments, anything to address emergency response in the various situations that uh, the residents commented about? I share the concern with the tree stumps that are going to be mitigated. Uh, that is the choke point. That is my concern. I think I share that with Sandy as well as Chief Ike. Uh, those are going to be mitigated. As far as that road surface and, and response into there, once that's mitigated, I have no concerns. Okay. <coughs> Last one I have is a um, comment by the one speaker and the applicant is, just walked away from me, precise grading plan, Chad. What is your, uh, condition 28. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the city engineer has looked at this extensively and discussed it a number of times, and he believes it's necessary and and reasonable for the project, considering all the work that's been done on the property. Okay, so the other engineer that stated that it was 50 yards or less of material? Again, we're going to disagree with that on principle. It's it's more. Okay. But we again, we've looked at it. We've considered it, sides of the buildings, the foundations required, the footings. Um, we just believe it's well more than the 50 cubic yards, and we think it's more than reasonable to request a precise grading plan. Okay, and then you also list on your precise grading plan paving. We'll prepare on an on-site precise grading, comma, paving. There is no paving. If and drainage plan. Right. If And again, we, that's part of that. They're going to look at to determine the flow of the water because of the buildings, how they've impacted. They're going to look at that. And whatever paving they're looking to do, it's not required to do it um, any specific amount. It's just what ends up being determined related to any type of ADA issues are required. We want that um, identified in, in the precise grading plan. Okay. But at this time, again, we, we have already understood that there's not a plan to pave parking lot. There's more plan to use right. DG or... Uh, or uh, um, uh, aggregate, etc. So it's just we, it's a catch all in that process if when it's no developed. If there's no paving, it's. Uh, yeah, it's just well, it's not going to require. We just, it's a catch all for when you do progressive grading plan, you look for those elements. Okay, and you so. You document why they're not necessary. So Councilman Hoffman brought up about ADA access and all of that, that those percentages from wherever the, the required uh, <coughs> parking, your ADA path of travel on this precise grading plan, then you will also be checking uh, those percentages and the path of travel? Correct. And which again, we the, the requirements will be determined by the building department and will be included in the precise grading plan. So we'd first need to get determined how many um, and, the, and the size of the uh, ADA parking lots, spots and the pathway to each of those respective buildings uh, so that they're shown in that precise grading plan. Path of travel is going to be you then. Yes. Or your building, right? Yeah. Okay. And if you'll let me jump in on that, the, uh, the applicant spoke and stated that uh, Commission Member Acevedo stated that the gravel is an ADA path of travel. And the um, the comment that came back, because we actually had this plan reviewed by our consulting plan checking company, Wildan. It wasn't done in-house. We sent it out to them. They did not put in that it had to be paved. So whatever is required per the building code, that's what we're going to require. But right now, the path of travel does not have to be paved the way it is right now. And I understand that, but you have to have a path of travel yes. for, for yep. your ADA access. Yep. Okay. So your recommendation is there's no modification to that uh, condition 28? Uh, correct. Okay, I th think I'm good. Thank you. Okay, John. Uh, Greg had brought up about and Kevin about allowing the use, allowing events going on over there while they're doing the work to get in compliance. And you said it'd be okay if they used the uh, buildings. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. You're talking about using the building before they got the fire sprinklers in there? Or no, I didn't. No, I said I think the opposite of that. Steve asked whether or not they could hold events outside. That's a non-issue. Yeah, outside. Uh, utilization of the building since we, before they're inspected and, and make sure they're code compliant, does represent a little bit of a problem. We don't have any liability, but frankly, the property owner has significant liability. Right, without the sprinklers in there and a big crowd and everything. That's yeah, I mean, I don't, know, I, yeah, I don't know about sprinklers or any of that stuff. But uh, what it, it's got to meet the code. Is that what you were, you guys were talking about, Sandy? That those buildings had to be sprinklered. Yes, the um, the large barn does. Yes. Okay. Not the restrooms. All right. All right. Another one for you, since the chief's not answering questions tonight. Uh, <laughs> you're talking about the uh, weight of the fire engine. Yes. Okay. So when you get to the gate to the gentleman's property. And come in on that driveway. That the uh, driveway is heavy enough to hold up the uh, fire truck. I would say it should be. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about the design of the driveway because it was installed when they built the larger home. Right. But I would assume that they would have, have built that to the standards. And I didn't look the other day. Does uh, Tim? Does that driveway go all the way around your house where the truck can just make a circle and get out? We actually have three entrances. Okay. The fire department has been there the last two or three years. I also want to say one thing about this. You have three gates. You have a parking monitor out there. I guess to more than ours. The car you're served talking to and two more, wave them to another gate and have another guy check them up because I don't. And you have traffic going both ways all the time because a lot of people come in and they drop off on Ubers. Comes all the way into the event. On the right and the gate on the left, go all the way around the whole property and that's all you do. And that's on the south side of the property there, where you come in your gate. Uh, I know where your parking lot is, but they can come around the house and go back out that way. All right, and you do have somebody, you said, checking names off so that you don't get it crashed and yeah. some crazy come in there and cause a bunch of problems. We also have them out there to keep the traffic out. Okay, and is Sonia still here? Question for you. Your your customers are at the stable. They all park on your property right in that little parking lot to the left there. It's not block the street and everything. Okay, thank you. That's that's all I have, folks. Anybody else got any more? Okay, Kevin. Uh, so the the grading plan. The fear is that he's going to end up having to put in drains and all kinds of stuff. Is that possible? Is that a realistic? Well, yeah, the engineering plan will determine, because he's obligated to determine and identify the flow of water that's coming onto the property. It's, it, he has a history of, of the water runs down the road and runs through his property. It normally goes to, I think, mainly to the the west of that area. Um, but again, because of the home, of the buildings that are there, your, part of your precise grading plan is to identify the flow of water through that area. So it doesn't mean he's going to have drainage uh, in there or required. It really depends on what the engineer uh, determines of what flows going that way, how much of a change in pitch and any, any elevations have occurred, et cetera. Again, you're unfortunately reverse engineering this because it wasn't done um, Yeah, I guess that's properly. my <clears throat> I guess that's my question is that, um, and just to be devil's advocate, how, how would we know that, that more than 50 cubic yards of dirt had been moved if it was already done before we got there? Well, again, we're confident of, again, the size of the buildings and the footings that are required that it's more than 50 cubic yards. And again, it, it, we think it's more than reasonable for the size of the project and what's been done that a precise grading plan is is relevant. It would be, it would be required if this was, was coming to us from the very beginning. We would require this. So it's just only fair as far as a project. Another app that came in choosing to do the same project now that this is something that might be considered in the future for other properties, um, we would require this requirement for them because that's how we want to look at the projects. When does understand. that kick in? How What size building does that kick in, a precise grading plan? Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not sure as far as is the size. It's, it's usually uh, mainly off of uh, how much material you're moving. Thanks. I apologize. Dominic was here. He can more eloquently explain why they've determined this is required. Well, I mean, as you know, I, I kind of don't always trust when they talk about cubic feet being moved. I get a little kind of a little nervous about that stuff. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Steve, on that property, when it was originally built, was there a grading plan for that original house? For the original structures or had to be somewhere? Well, they had to do a PAD certification for the house before they could build it. Um, if they, I, I don't know if they were required to do a grading plan. And it was built when? Mm, I think in, uh, it's been there for a while. Yeah, I just. It I is. know it's a lottery house, yeah, but it's I, it's still. The, I don't remember the year. But I, I don't think it's over twenty years old. No, no. So what you're saying is is that the grading plans and and we're basing this assumption of this need for grading in less than our home is less than twenty years old, and I don't think that that property has changed that much in twenty years seeing that, the actual grade. Yes, he did build a, prop, a house, uh, the extra barn in there, and things like that. So somewhere along the line, there is a plan for that original structure, and grades are done and set. So I, uh, we can sit here and argue 50 yards got moved or not, but your original plan should have that in there somewhere, that that was done, and there was a plan set up when that original property was done. And I don't know why we're going to argue on this when there should be plans somewhere that need to be checked. You're talking about two. Di you're talking about totally different structures. You're talking about the house versus the buildings. The buildings are uh, newly constructed, right? And that and that's required to do it every time when you, when you meet certain thresholds. So you're not talking apples and apples. So there, if if there was, which I don't know if there is or not, a grading plan that was required for the house, we'd have to look it up. It's a different condition when you're building additional new buildings on that same lot because the area in question may or may not have been graded. So I, I don't know. But again, we're just simply looking at it as what was constructed and what was done. Right. If that was been a, if that would have been a, uh, a horse barn there, I guarantee you would, we still wouldn't see a grading permit based upon that because it, most people don't. If that would have been an MD barn put in there, he wouldn't have been accessing for a grading permit. Because you don't. All the years I'm planning, I didn't see one. And we approved a lot of buildings and a lot of structures in the area without grading permits that so were put on properties. And the first thing I was always asked them was, where does the water go? And those are things that were done for several years. So, you know, I, I understand how we apply because of MPDES and all that. It's just one of those things that how much. We, you know, we're, we're arbitrarily saying he moved 50 yards, and we don't know. And that's what I'm trying to get at is why we're forcing this grading thing on everyone. So that's all. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Greg, so Ted, how about something like this that staff look at going? go back to the newest house the new structure that was permitted that was built there should be a grading plan with that I'm making that assumption if there is you can you can take all those points and try to back into a, a determination on those other structures how much grading was done I mean you would have those elevations and again, I'm not opposed to an alter. We've used it on other projects, how to creatively develop the precise grading plan. Um, but I would put that obligation on the applicant to determine that, not staff. Okay. Uh, so I'm if he develops something, that. And, that, and again, it's an idea, because uh, we've done it in other properties, including um, uh, the more recent one with the church, is we used um, part of their um, site plan to show grades uh, and elevations to create a, a 
grading plan because they didn't originally do one. So again, we, we staff as wise, we will look and consider ideas of how to get us what we're looking for um, okay. in a manner that we think is reasonable and fair. So if there's additional or existing information that could be used and uh, and to, to develop that grading plan, we'll certainly consider it, uh, and we always have. All right, how about this? Ted, if you're in agreement that the condition stands right now and the applicant's engineer can go to the city or go to the applicant, find those plans that are from the permitted house and make his civil engineering determination and, and make let him make the case that 50 yards weren't with moved. Okay, if he can prove that based off permanent information, that would be acceptable, would it not? S staff is of the opinion that the grading, precise grading plan is required because of the conditions on the site. Um, I think it's it's reasonable to do what you originally suggested was if there are elements on the property that allow him to develop a precise grading plan using existing information, I think that's fair and reasonable and we do that. I think in regards to the engineer trying to prove that well, something I guess that's what I'm saying. Wasn't Let there. them make the case, though. Yeah, I, I just right. think, again, we've already had the discussion okay. um, uh, between the chambers and ourselves, and we disagree. Uh, so I don't see that changing. Um, I think the compromise is, again, is maybe using existing material that makes it easier and cheaper to develop the precise grading plan uh, and show that all those, again, the flows, et cetera, that we need for that, that plan. Um, I, guess I go back to the fact that there was a plan there, and we just have to see how much it was changed. Right. But that's not a staff function, what I'm saying. No, that and the if the applicant engineer. can do that, that's fine. I mean, that's he should be doing that to research it, like anybody else. Right, and again, the issue for me is the grading plan could have been just for the house. It's not for all the other areas where the accessory buildings have now existing. So, and that's what we're focused on. We're not talking about a grading plan for the house. Correct. But it's for it, all these buildings. Well, so. we won't know until we pull the. It's presented. Pull them out. So I have no, How many one other feet item. Is that one building, Greg? How many square feet is the? The um, sort of barn building. Is it 2,000 square feet, I think. <clears throat> I just rolled the plans back up. Thank so my other see. item, Steve, yeah. is item well, number before you Before you leave that item, yeah. maybe one of the things you can do, given the circumstances, is if the staff and applicant can't work it out, that they, he has the ability to come back to you and talk about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what good that would do. I would say that that condition stands until you can prove otherwise. And I think that's a staff function and an engineering function. That shouldn't come back to a council. That's my personal opinion. Uh, number three, noise and operational hours. So I think we've addressed noise and conditions, operational hours. We have an end date, but we have not come up with a start time when activities can begin. And that was one of the questions that, first page of your staff report, Steve. Yeah, <clears throat> just let me That was a concern of the Planning Commission that you had a thing, everything's over at 10 o'clock, when do things start? Right. So I think we have to come up with a answer on that. There's no restriction on when events could begin. Right. It's right. the last condition. So if you want to modify it, we'll, we'll modify condition 63. Okay, then my question is, modify it to what? What's staff's recommendation for a uh, time to start? Don't ask my neighbors. What do the neighbors say? You just take a vote? <laughs> so, did you want to do or? Yeah, you, you might want to ask. Okay. 
our current noise, our current ordinance, not the noise ordinance, but our current activity ordinance for construction is at 7 a.m. in the morning. During the week. During the week, and so we have to look at a weekend time, and you know, even at Ingalls, it's at seven between seven and eight. Most start at eight o'clock. You can put eight o'clock on the weekend, and then you would probably be pretty consistent with what goes on up, up at uh, the public arena. So but our construction activity is seven a.m. on Monday through Friday, or even Saturday. So what if ten, like something like eight o'clock for equestrian activities, yeah, and what other activities? I think you'd want to just uh, it, or if we get too specific on this, it's it's going to get confusing. Yeah, I know. And you, so, so the easiest thing is you hit the happy medium. And just say eight a.m. Eight a.m. Because they still have to get a permit for the noise anyway on the outside. On the if outside. it's outside, okay. And they're saying it's equestrian events, and maybe there's an early wedding or something that they'd have to okay. have a microphone of some kind. So try to finish up, Steve. Will you give a list now of all the conditions that have been added, changed, modified, or deleted? Yes. Okay, so the first one is condition 13. We're taking out that second clause. Uh, this is in regards to the maintaining landscaping. Uh, they don't have to maintain right-of-way landscaping. And then... Um, I don't know if the intent was to add a condition that the CUP runs with the owner or stays with the land. The normal state of the law is that the CUP runs with the land. And if he decides we'll get the, him passing, we'll s just suggest that he wants mm -hmm. to sell the business. That that business is subject to the same conditions. So that as long as you're happy with the conditions in the existing conditional use permit, it shouldn't really make much difference who's... Yeah, so then if we want to, like, make sure there's no restaurant there ever, it needs to run with the land. Right. Okay. And I'm then if he violates, that. then you can revoke a CUP and he's out of business. Okay. I'm good with that. Though. Some future guy. Okay. Gotcha. No, no parking on North by any of the, the participants in events. No restaurant or um, kitchen facility permanent. No permanent restaurant or kitchen facility. Uh, temporary directional signs during prior to events to direct people at North and California to turn left instead of go straight. Um, 28 is not changing. Condition number 63 will add the provision that events don't start before 8 a.m. And that's what I have. Stump. Well, the, the, the owner of the tree said she's going to do it, but okay. the, stop, I don't know that we can add a condition stop. on this. And then the kitchen. You, okay, I mean, you. Well, to the to the extent that the uh, owner of this site has an interest in the the private street, uh, I suppose that we can condition yeah. the removal of the stumps on. I think he'll do it, but I just would feel better if they condition it. Okay. And then the kitchen, can they have a sink to wash dishes and stuff? The kitchen is, can they have a refrigerator? They can have a refrigerator and a sink. They they just can't have a outside of like warming plates and stuff. They can't have a stove and oven and that sort of thing. Okay, Steve, so let me throw something at you. Tim talked about having his barbecues. Does that fall into that? No. Okay. All right, just trying to keep this up, 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 up board. So, so, Steve, when you just mentioned that about kitchen, what you can have and what you can't, and go back, it's basically, yeah, you can have a sink and a stove. No, a sink. no sir. Or a, sink and a refrigerator. And a refrigerator. Right. Why do we require a grease interceptor then? For washing dishes. Okay. I don't agree with that, though. I mean... 
dishwasher. That, that's why it's in there. So can he have a dishwasher? Yeah, I have to do a collector on the bottom. We. It, we would treat it similar to how we look at a, for instance, like a garage. You can have, people can have dishwashers in their garage. They can mm -hmm. have washing machines in their garage. So we would tell them if they wanted a dishwasher, they could do that. But they need. But a we wouldn't require them to have a grease interceptor. But they do need a grease interceptor. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll Is this more of a health? I, I don't really support it, but is that more of a health department requirement, or I don't want to box us into it? But it's more of a sewer. It's again, it's more of a default of uh, building code as far as when there's food uh, on site that default to a, gr a grease interceptor. So uh, we're just taking it for its face value. Uh, there's food. There's food there. Food is cleaned up. Um, and washed off, you get grease. It's whether it's overkill, yeah, you probably could considering the operation, but it's just more of the what ifs. What if the next person is doing something totally different? And where is that in the code? I, I'd have to look it up. I, again, I'm not all up. We, we just traditionally have done. Where does that information come from? Come from? Yeah. Building code, health, health code, again, as far as. Was that from Will Dan? Uh, we will occasionally talk to Will Dan regarding their recommendation regarding size. Uh, if we're concerned about the type of, of operation, whether it's significant, if it's large enough or not, the okay. default is at 750, and you know whether there's anything smaller that we can get away with. Um, and versus doing an in versus and that's when you really get into an internal uh, grease catch um, device that you put in your plumbing to kind of grab it, and that's what you clean. Um, uh, I forget, I'm trying to remember the right terminology, um, but there are there are businesses where they have an internal grease interceptor or ca uh, box that they maintain internally to in, in, yeah in, I, I, catch. I know what they are. Right. That's why I'm disagreeing. So my recommendation is that that staff look to see where that's. In the code where that's required required because I think for this operation it shouldn't be required if they're just bringing in food yeah I mean if they're so, just throwing it away and they're not washing dishes and or pouring anything down the sink um, and guard down the garbage disposal um, yeah I mean you can make a condition basically it already has to be thrown right. away and then it would be a non-issue so that's my recommendation. Is you, you can let it stand, but I'd like I'd like to know where that is in the code that's telling you it's required. Well, again, it's. I think this is more boilerplate. Yeah. Well, again, it's a it's it. a determination by the department based off the activity of what's necessary. And could we, or do we have the the discretion to not require it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and we justify it later on if if an issue occurred of why we didn't do it. Um, so again, I don't have any heartburn if it's not put in. Um, I would still recommend there should be some sort of internal catch basin if there's going to be sink um, and washing of dishes, etc., just to help um, say we had some measure of. Uh, and and then it's really just them maintaining it. Uh, should it start to back up or get any grease build up, it's on them. They'll see it occur and have it back up, and they'll know it's right there inside their their building. I'm just curious where in the plumbing code that's going to be because he's going to have to have floor drains at it. And I think once building gets done with all this, that we'll have a better understanding. Right. I mean, it, that's just my two cents. I don't. Uh, Chad, you said something about throwing it away, and you know the recycle business better than I do. Didn't the state come up with a new thing of getting rid of grease on with trash? Mm -hmm. They weren't supposed to do it anymore. 
Well, one of the one of the requirements that'll be on the property because it is does have food on it is they're going now going to have to have organics uh, waste um, containers for all that food to go into there to be picked up by waste management. So any any organics Welcome to California. are required to be disposed of now. So yeah, I, now, I, I know a, that's what I'm saying. You mentioned trash, and I just said you, it, it's not as easy as it, no. because of the rules that the environmentalists put out. Yeah, we're currently issuing letters to all the businesses. We've done inspections. And, and, to, and informing them if they don't already have organic service that they must get it or risk daily fines. Yeah. So one of the issues in in as this property is, if it's determined to continue, is they will have to get organics uh, containers for all the food that they're throwing away. And then that has to be picked up by waste management. It cannot go in the regular trash. Um, so that'll be part of that process to educate them and have them understand. And they can determine whether or not they just need a... Well, 165 gallon cart and it just gets picked up once a week um, or uh, something larger it really depends on how much food is being uh, disposed of on the property yep that's what it is I knew there was uh, and, and to answer council and uh, Newton's thing about the grease traps uh, the city of LA or the county of LA one of I think it's a city they are enforcing that uh, grease traps on their areas especially on their the new law that allows kitchens and, and homes to, for private food because it's found they found it was the uh, ruining their sewer ser their sewer lines yeah, because of all the the buildup and they're getting them plugged up so yeah. that was one of the reasons why the degreaser situation it's increasing because of the, they're permitting these in uh, in home kitchens for preparation of foods they created a problem now they have to fix it and again i'm not as concerned with this particular operation no i'm not either it's but not a daily activity no. where you normally get most other restaurants it's just more of a default when we get when we get a application for a business or even a retro even a new owner on a, on a normal commercial um um restaurant and they don't have a, a grease interceptor we make them put one in um, and it just fell into for, for any better purposes kind of like boilerplate commercial business foods being prepped got to put a grease interceptor in uh, but it doesn't mean we can't customize it to say you know what based off what you're not going to do there now and a better understanding that you can just do a, 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 a if you even have to because you're not doing any floor drains or anything else it may not be required at all but we need to see what they're ultimately asking to get permitted to determine what's going to be required so i guess my question would be how do we determine how to condition it if we don't know because like my general perception would be on condition number 33 to just strike that last sentence i would condition it to say that that it's required until determined by the building department and engineering that it's not necessary because the activities approved that are going to be conducted on site because then it gives us the flexibility, which which Councilman Newt was talking about, is to evaluate it and make that determination. And again, understanding the council's concerns about it, uh, obviously we're not going to be aloof about making a decision. We're going to make sure that we can defend of why it's necessary. And it gives us the option to maybe to look at other alternatives that are less intrusive. Okay. Okay, folks, what's your pleasure? Do I hear a motion? Of some sort. With all of the make a motion with all of the contingencies and the contingencies contained here with those changes that we approve this. Second. Under discussion. Do, John, do we have to have any mention in this motion of that we're overturning the action of the Planning Commission? Well, you are under fact, the though, because you're under the appeal actions. But but yes, that's probably appropriate to indicate that you're overturning the planning commission decision and approving the conditional use permit as amended. So I amend my motion that we are overturning the planning commission and we're approving the CUP with the conditions contained therein and then also contained within this document with the with the changes we've already agreed to. You've already read the list. I'm assuming you have the list. Um, 
Is that good, John? Under discussion, just real quick, I want to make sure one clarification on this, the event signage. Keeping in mind that the signage should be placed on the private property road and not in the public right of way because that's a, uh, a designated trail and requires an encroachment permit. So then I will amend to make sure I, that the signage has to be on the private property on the street. And um, anything else? Yeah. And and what that means kind of de facto is if the uh, owners of the private street, Philly Lane, don't want it, then they can say no. It's not Philly Lane. No, not Philly. <laughs> they're gonna get their, they're, they're, they're getting their own signing. signage, John. We're all coming to your <laughs> street. <laughs> north. I'm talking about the directional signage. <laughs> Probably very much in favor. You guys go this way. Don't come down. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. So anyway, but that's the motion, and I'm sticking to it. Did we have a second? Under discussion. Under discussion. Uh, Tim, you're sitting here as the applicant. Before we go any further, make a vote. Are you, you agree to that? These conditions, okay. Just want to make sure before we go through this. Thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk, you got all that? <laughs> Are you both? Yes, please vote. <laughs> Motion passes unanimous. Okay, thank you one and all. Thank you folks for coming and speaking. And uh, everybody remaining civil tonight, that was very good. Now I gotta find my agenda again. We have uh, oh, Kevin's. Yeah. Oh, no. Kevin's. Yeah, Kevin, bring your deal up. So, um, as those of uh, we we were at the League of Cities, and I think I sent it all to you, but uh, it appears that SB 50 is coming back. It was had sort of a two-year layoff, um, and Senator Roth is a co-author of it. And so it would be uh, what I'm looking for. I talked to Alti today, who's Senator Roth's, because uh, I sent an email to Tyler, and I wanted to find out, was he really doing this? And I, I said, you know, this is pretty unpopular. And Alti caught me today at the Chamber of Commerce meeting and said he would really like the council, if they have a mind to, to send a letter to his boss and state that we really object to this and asking, you know, basically what it's about is they're stripping us of local control. And whether it would affect us or not affect us, I think we need to look at it, but, but it's, I mean, I know for a fact, like I said, I'm pretty certain Eastvale is going to come out against it. Europa Valley is. Corona, there's, there's going to try to be movement over there. Uh, and the League of Cities, if you got the thing that Aaron sent, um, we have to really watch this bill and to have a, our own senator. So I think it needs to be strongly worded and, uh, you know, say, why are you doing this? This is something we are totally opposed to. And the League of Cities is opposed to it also, unless it's heavily amended. And that's the uh, proposal I'm making, that we send a, a letter. And I would like it to be a letter that's signed by all of us. Not a letter just by the city manager, but they see all five signatures on that letter. <coughs> we, have a, we have a second on that? Okay. Uh, since we did agendize this, uh, I don't mind doing it. I just, there is Aaron Sassy from the league did send us uh, a certain talking points on it um, about the league, and I don't know how many of you read that. And Andy, if you read, yeah, that. I sent it to okay. everybody. And it just, it, it's, it, it's for the for the audience view the the talking points of this thing, just so we're all in the same 
page is that uh, despite recent amendments the city blah blah town unfortunately must remain opposed to SB 50 unless it's further amended uh, the city of Norco is pleased to see and this is I'm just reading this throwing name out, is pleased to see that recent amendments attempt to create an alternative planning process for the jurisdictions to develop a local flexibility plan unfortunately we can't evaluate whether the local flexibility plan is a viable alternative because the amendments do not clearly identify the elements of the plan. Additionally, it is unclear why some cities should be treated differently just because they happen to have a population less than 50,000 and are also in a county with a population of less than 600,000. It would be, which they're exempt from it, but you didn't know. It would be much more appropriate to consider the full range of community characteristics when determining which areas of the state SB 50 should apply. By allowing developers to override the state approved housing plans, SB 50 seriously calls the question the need for cities to develop these community-based plans and the justification for spending millions of state and local funds on planning process. Why would the legislator, why would the legislator pass a bill that encourages developers to defy state approved housing plans and essentially waste millions of, of taxpayer dollars? By not defining the job rich areas in the statute, there is also there is no way of knowing if, if SB 50 would be actually accomplished in a state goals. It's hard to understand why the legislator would want the executive branch to, to define the essential terms that have a broad implication for how SP50 would be implemented. Uh, I would make sure that we, we, when we do address this, is that we include the fact that it takes away our rights as a charter city to determine what we plan, uh, our planning for us as as outlined by our charter for the minimum half acre lots and the rural animal keeping. Uh, that would just be my added point of it. Well, although we, we do personalize, we make sure we personalize it though it's to Senator Roth, our senator. So. Okay, we had a motion and a second. Council Member Hoffman? Yes. Council Member Grenmeyer? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Council Member Newton? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, we have uh, City Council, City Manager, Staff, Communication. We'll start with John? Nope. Robin? No. Greg? Yes. Broke the chain. Chad. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to give you the credit and it's a compliment, so mm -hmm. hang on to your Record chair. This. <laughs> I'm giving you the credit. 6th Street, in front of the grocery outlet construction project that's going on, thank you for making them tear out the asphalt temp patches where I lost a filling and make them that you made them go back with trench plate in. <coughs> in all their ditches across the street. I want to let you know I noticed that and there were multiple complaints. You get a gold star momentarily, so. <laughs> Dana? Nothing to report, sir. Mark? Chad? Steve? Lizette, Chief, you can talk now. <laughs> okay, Lieutenant. <laughs> Ted. Chad, this is your night. You got kudos from the CRC. You got another gold star. Uh, they appreciate you trimming the trees, uh, the rapid response you did across from there uh, to help curtail the illegal activity and the, and the people are hanging out uh, around the uh, prison. So keeping those trees him like that really helped them out. So they appreciate that. Uh, on another note, and I think, and Andy, when do we plan to redo our, our, our mid our mid year uh, budget? Soon, sometime. Yes, soon. The mid year budget review will be coming to you. I believe on February, second meeting in February. Okay. Uh, one of the things in, in when you do your major budget, if we could look at the possibility of uh, increasing the law enforcement staff, uh, just to 
to see what we have or the options we have uh, for that to see where we're at with the help from Lizette's people and yourselves to see where we're at financially to do that just take a look thank you Kevin really quickly uh, who's in charge of Kelly's idea to put the stuff on the trails who that was amazing. I'll tell you, I, I've gotten probably 15 compliments, people talking about how the how your Measure R funds at work, and that is fantastic. We don't get a lot of compliments like that, and I understand Kelly designed it, so be sure to give a shout out to her. Thank you.